This is the Amp Hour Podcast. Released January 7th, 2018. Episode 374. An interview with Clifford Wolf. Welcome to the Amp Hour. I'm Chris Gamble of Contextual Electronics. And I'm Clifford Wolf of Symbiotic EDA. Welcome, Clifford. We usually don't talk to Europe that often, and as I've said in the past, because of the time zone stuff, but uh, I'm super glad to be talking to you right now. Yeah, I'm, I'm super glad that I made it. It's great to be on the show. Yeah, so uh, you people probably know you from Twitter or your FPGA stuff and... I mean, just, I would probably call you prolific on a lot of the, I'm, I'm actually looking at your GitHub contribution stuff and I'm like, oh, that's a lot of green. Oh man. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're going to be talking about FPGAs today. We're going to be talking about, uh, you know, risk, uh, risk five, I keep saying risk V, uh, but, and EDA and Verilog and, you know, Linux and all this stuff. Um, but maybe it'd be best if we started back at the beginning. So how did you, how did you get into all this stuff? Yeah, I think my, my first real proper like open source project was, was Rock Linux. And I started Rock Linux in 1997, uh, maybe 1998, something like that. Okay. Um, and um, it was uh, not really a Linux distribution, but a system that would allow you to build a custom Linux distribution. Oh, um, so the idea of Rock Linux was that back then it took hours to build stuff like libc and, and the C compiler and, and all that kind of things. Mm -hmm. um, so if you would need to go through a lot of trial and error to get a distribution built, uh, then this would be very, very time consuming. And the idea of Rock Linux was that pretty much everything was already pre-set up and you could just make the small modifications like... Uh, what C library do you want to use? Uh, do you want to use a special compiler uh, change that uh, does some tricks to protect against stack overflows, uh, uh -huh. things like that. Yeah. Um, and that was uh, pretty successful, I would say, for a couple of years. And then it became more or less obsolete uh, because the computers became faster and faster. Uh -huh. um, and what took uh, many, many hours to figure out in the mid 90s suddenly was something that you could uh, try a couple of times in a matter of, of minutes, uh, 10 years later on the faster computers. So there was no no really big advantage anymore of having this uh, this pre-set up uh, yeah. thing. That... Is it almost like a template? Is that kind of the idea? Yeah, so essentially it was a, a huge uh, a set of shell scripts. Oh, um, okay, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I think it was really a demonstration what you could do if you really... Uh, uh, would like to do big software engineering in, in, in shell scripts, um, including things like the, the bash shell, um, and I assume others too, have things like uh, plug-enable modules so you can extend it with C code. Uh, and we did stuff like that for a few things. Uh, it had a big uh, uh, ARC, so AWK scripts, uh -huh. uh, to, to solve graph theory problems resulting from dependency graphs. Um, so it was not really your your typical shell script uh, just say, okay, just run these commands in this order, but it was more like a, a big software project. But it, mm -hmm. it literally started out as well, just run these uh, uh, commands in this order to build package XY. Um, and uh, and for that, shell was very good. So it expanded from there. So this was my first really big uh, project. And I think... Mm -hmm. um, in in a way, um, it was uh, very representative of the kind of projects that I do, uh, because I always uh, um, do other stuff, and then I end up building tools to do the stuff I started out with. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I yeah. built Rock Linux not because uh, I started out with, hey, let's build a system to build custom Linux distributions, but instead uh, I had one very, very small minor project where I wanted to build a Linux distribution. Um, and there I figured out that it was actually quite hard to build a distribution, but it was hard in a more or less unnecessary way. You have to like rediscover things that probably 500 people for you also right. already discovered yep. when they yep. built a the custom distribution. So, uh, so I thought, well, let's build a tool that makes it much, much easier to build Linux distributions. 
Um, a project that maybe more of your listeners may may mm -hmm. know is uh, Open Escut. That's right. Um, yeah. So we've um, talked about that before, and I've I think my buddy did it. Well, used it a bunch, and it's it's very script focused as well, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. So it's like the the programmer's uh, 3D cut tool. Right. Yeah. Um, so instead of 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 clicking on things and dragging them around with your mouse, you essentially write a script in a special language. Um, that's very like like inspired by functional languages. Um, mm -hmm. I would say it's kind of a mix between a functional and a uh, declarative language um, that essentially describes your 3D object. Um, and then you can make changes to this like program um, and then uh, click the view button and it will uh, display a preview of what uh, this object uh, will, will look like. That's um, interesting. And and people are uh, pretty divided when it comes to open escort. So there are like uh, people with a programming background that that say, oh, finally a three D cut tool that I actually can use and want to use. And there are a lot of people with a background in like mechanical engineering and right. uh, they know the other, the traditional tools and they say, this is completely unusable. You can't do anything with <laughs> that. Um, Mine's more of a, I avoided coding at all costs, even scripting. And I'm like, nah, I'd rather just see it as it happens. So yeah. Yeah. Um, and, and that's fine too. I mean, um, I, I think that's the, the great thing that we don't need like uh, one tool to that right. serves everyone, but right. instead we can see what 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 is the actual application, what is the um um what 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 is the knowledge the the user already has, and mm -hmm. yep. uh, and I think there is no catch-all solution for all different versions uh, of of tuples uh, with yeah like that that we can find. Um, yeah, uh, so so that's open Escort. Um I, are you still are you still actively developing that? Like, when did that start, and is that still going? Uh, well, it is still actively developed, but uh -huh. I'm not doing it. Uh, oh, so okay, okay. I did it for like uh, two years. Um, I started the project, maintained it for two years, and then gave it to Marius Kinto uh, because he was very active with the project, and I kind of wanted to move on to new stuff. Mm -hmm. um, so I said, "Do you want to take over the project?" And he said, "Yes." Um, and I think he's still uh, uh, maintaining it, but now there is a, uh, I think, a little bit larger community of people actually yeah. doing stuff there. Yeah, it looks um, like I'm looking on the site too. It looks like Google some summer code picked up some stuff. Other people are probably uh, contributing. So that's yeah. that's interesting. Does that happen with a lot of your projects where they kind of take on their own life? Of is it like how long? How like did did Rock Linux take on other people as well, or was it mostly just you on that one? Uh, yeah, it was a small group with Rock Linux. Um, uh -huh. And with Rock Linux, I would say I kind of missed that point where I should have like uh, uh, given it to somebody else uh, to, uh -huh. to maintain uh -huh. it. Um, there is a fork of Rock Linux actually that is still active. Um, it's called uh, T2 and maintained by René Rebe. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's still active. I'm, I'm not 100% sure. Okay. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so, so maybe with Rock Linux, I should have made a similar decision much earlier. Uh, and then I would have had uh, a couple of more years to to work on other interesting stuff. Yeah, no, it's mm -hmm. it's. I mean, that community piece is really tough, right? I mean, like like even with the Amp Hour community, right? We we are pretty scattered. There's a lot of people that are out there that you know we kind of have things we all talk about. We all enjoy talking to the same guests, right? Like you know, people are obviously listening to this and they're interested in what you're doing. Um, but it's not like you know, like actually maintaining it of like this ongoing conversation is always tough because of the human dynamics of it as well, right? So there's the human dynamics of the community of like power distributions of, you know, what 1% do most of the talking, right? But then the same thing probably happens with the code contribution where 1% or less contribute, whereas many more people benefit from it. So Absolutely. That's, yeah, it's, that's got to be mm. kind of tough. So um, I think with, with Open Escort, the, uh, the interesting thing about Open Escort at the time where it came to be um, is uh, the parametric uh, aspect of it. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, so when you do like injection molding, uh, it's really, really expensive to, to produce a mold, right? right. Um, so if you would like to make a variation of, of your design, um, then uh, uh, you will pay a lot of money for the new mold. So it doesn't matter if an engineer is busy like an afternoon modifying your design. Um, but with 3D printing, uh, you can do very uh -huh. cheap one-offs. Yeah. Um, 
And uh, one thing with, uh, so at MetaLab, that's the local hackerspace, uh, we had a lot of people come by and saying, well, this, I don't know, this knob on my stove broke, stuff uh -huh. like that. Can yeah. you print a new knob for it? Um, and uh, pretty soon we realized those knobs are actually all very similar. Uh -huh. um, yep. They are yep. like like uh, uh, three different uh, basic geometries. What like the the metal thing can look like the knob sits on. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, yeah. The um, flat side of the rounded out uh, yeah, you know, yeah, turning right. piece, right? Um, and then there is like uh, 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 what should the angle be of like the little indicator on the knob uh, uh -huh. with regard to that. And then uh -huh. there is like a, a diameter for the knob, and there is a diameter for the metal thing. Um, so. Um, so you can design each knob individually um, and spend an hour each time making just the right knob, or you can make a script once. And right. then when someone right. comes and says, my knob, knob broke, you just... Uh, right, put in uh, your dimensions ask... and... Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. You, you, you know already the five questions to ask, you put in the dimensions and the model is ready. That's um, great. And I think OpenSCAD would not have been able to pick up such a large community if it would have been there like five years earlier. Uh -huh. uh, because five years earlier, you didn't, you wouldn't have the uh, uh, means to produce this small one-off things. Uh -huh. um, um, so it would not be that that important to have this this scriptability and uh, uh, the the possibility to set this kind of parameters. Mm -hmm. So I think with the community building, it's uh, uh, a big question is always uh, at what time uh, do you start doing something. Right. Um, yep. And you can do exactly the same project five years earlier or five years later, and you will uh, have to manage a huge community in one case, or it will be just you. Uh, <laughs> right. Uh, with I have your... that one. I have that one. <laughs> yeah. 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 Uh, with, and, and, and sometimes you have to grow into it, right? Like you, uh -huh. you start out with something and everyone is telling you nobody's interested in it and you <laughs> stick with it for 10 years. And right. 10 years later, uh, the the surrounding evolved in a way, so, so suddenly right. your project becomes relevant to a larger number yeah. um, um, of people. Um, and yeah, I think... it took it took me twenty years to become an overnight success, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> I always love that phrase. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, yeah, and I think uh, uh, if you're like a little bit too late, um, uh -huh. um, so I think the right point to start is actually before this big need is. You need to be like a visionary first, and then. Uh -huh. Um, because because otherwise it, it can be that uh, a lot of people react to like the thing that you initially make, um, and uh, uh, you have a huge community overnight, uh, but then your project will disappear uh, equally fast because you just don't have any means to manage this kind of community. Right. Yep. Well, and also then you get people that are like, oh, well, you should do this and this and this and this, and it's just a bunch of opinions versus if you have that five years beforehand where you're just working on it, you have this vision, you've developed a thing, yeah, and then they yeah. come in, and it's like, oh, well, maybe it's actually useful now to have a little bit of input, but maybe not, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and in, in a way, this is very different from like how many startups work, right? Right. Because yep. usually you don't have funding to like stick with it for five years until your uh, product right. becomes relevant. Um, yeah, so I think the quite interesting dynamics there. Yeah, awesome. So, okay, so you did, obviously this is still going, so that was, I'd call that a success. Um, <laughs> so let, let's, keep, let's keep that train rolling. So how, how did then this translate into FPGAs? How did, you, how did you get started with FPGAs in the first place? Oh, uh, I got started with FPGAs much, much earlier, actually. Okay, uh, okay. So um, I think my, my first FPGA board was maybe uh, 1999, something like that. Mm, um, okay. Just just me playing around, learning a little bit of VHDL back then. Okay. Um, and I think I, I was doing that stuff in school, and like, I guess I was early 2000s as well. And so I remember like Cordis 2, it was Altera's, like they had like this, it was like just the lab board, but I it, it was definitely, you know, drawing lines between logic symbols for a lot of it. Uh, it was not pleasant. <laughs> yeah, I mean, for me, it was uh, was HDLs from like the get go, um, uh -huh. and I remember back at the time I looked like at the Xilinx manuals and the Altera uh -huh. manuals, uh -huh. um, and at least back then the uh, the Xilinx manuals were all about HDL based flow, uh -huh. and then there was like an appendix that said, oh, if you really want to, you can also draw schematics uh, right, using this right. and that tool, uh, right. but that's not really how you do it. Um, and then I looked. Well, that was at like the, a lot of the CPLD stuff too, right? Like yeah. CPLDs was a lot of the the logic drawing stuff. But Altera back then had uh, their manuals all uh, about the the schematic tools. Uh 
Oh, and then okay. they had an appendix that says, yeah, you could also use HDL, but that's very complicated. So I downloaded the documentation of both vendors, uh, and, uh, and that pretty much uh, um, was the deciding factor for me, that I knew I wanted to use uh, uh, HDL and uh -huh. not like schematic entry. Um, uh -huh. And and ever since I'm I'm exiling Sky, you know. Okay. The, oh, like the, okay. The exiling right. Skies and the Altera guys. Maybe maybe we should say Intel now. Um, uh, oh right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but uh, but but I spent most of my my FPGA career uh, working with uh, with Xilinx parts. Um, okay. So I can't even say in, in what aspects they are better today or worse uh, because. Uh, I don't really have the experience on on the Altera side, mm -hmm. uh, and I guess uh, most of the people who are religious about that uh, are in a very similar situation. Right. Um, oh yeah, yeah, no, no. I used to talk to the salespeople, and they would they'd be like, "Oh no, no, that's an Altera house. We don't know how to talk to them." Like it wasn't even it wasn't like trying. I mean, yes, they would try and get them to switch once in a while, but it'd be like that thing they'd go and try and do once a year, you know, versus like, hey. Come on in, because that's like it's much like CAD tools. It's a religion, and it's even worse because it's it's tied to your hardware. It's it's tied to all your past hardware, and it's just the switching cost is is ex very extreme. Yeah, you you really need to have a a some kind of special application that you can only do in the one universe and not in the other universe. Yeah. Yep. Um. And and even then, companies might might decide not just not to do a project. Uh, because it's not possible <laughs> with the FPGA they they already have. Because okay. they're afraid of the migration cost uh, uh, yep. or the overhead of just having to learn the other tools and the other devices for this one project. Sure. So what kind of, uh, so that's the, in the past I've done like signal processing on FPGAs. I've done video processing on FPGAs. I've seen other people doing video stuff. What were you, what were you generally using it for? Well, um, I always build CPUs. Um, oh, okay. Yep. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a software guy. We, we kind of like CPUs. Uh, so when we do hardware, we build CPUs. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 I mean, uh, some of the CPUs I built over over the the years. Uh, so I did FPGA for about uh, ten years professionally um, mm -hmm. for, for for a living, um, and and a lot of it was uh, was DSP work. Um, but um, but it was always like special processors uh, okay. that that are tailored towards one specific DSP program right, that they right. uh, they would execute. Right. Um, so it's like a super filter or something, super FIR filter. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, uh, more more complicated. Uh, yeah, I know. Uh, I'm than, just giving uh, the only than, real than exp yeah, yeah, yeah. example um, I know. <laughs> um, but but uh, I mean. One thing that you have with, with FRI filters is always uh, uh, the question of how many taps you have and how many yep. samples do you need to process in a second. Sure. Um, and in many applications, your um, FPGA clock will be much, much faster than your sample clock. Um, or uh, you will only have to process a small snippet every once in a while. Mm -hmm. um, so fear filters are really, really simple to build if you have a low number of taps and a high number of samples because it ends up just build a pipeline, right? Uh -huh. um, but if you have uh, a huge number of taps but a very, very small number of samples, uh, then you need to figure out a way to reuse the same um, um, infrastructure over and over again. Use Got the it. same multiplier for all the taps. Uh, so essentially, your control logic uh, becomes uh, more complex and your data path becomes simpler in a way. Um, mm -hmm. And you could think of the stuff that I did as like the extreme of that, um, where you have a uh, uh, unimaginably complex control logic uh, that makes sure that it can do everything it can do with a very, very simple data path. <laughs> I guess, yeah, that's the CPU in general, right? That's like you have an ALU that you keep using over and over again and stuff like that. Yeah, right, keep, right. Yeah. Uh, but in this case, it's not usually not a, a CPU. It's more like uh -huh. a, a microcode programmed special uh -huh. purpose uh, processor. So I did a lot of, of, of building CPUs uh, and also uh, build cast kind of, of CPUs because somehow you have to write the microcode and uh, the microcode programs for those uh, usually in the thousands of instructions. So you don't want to handwrite that anymore. 
Right. Um, and usually people will come and say, oh, that, that's great, but uh, now we had this other idea and uh, can you just change your design so it makes this calculation instead of that calculation? And if you just <laughs> spent like two weeks handwriting an assembler program with a couple of thousand instructions um, and then they uh, come along and say, well, can you just change it so that everything is in the front, is in the back and everything that's in the back is in the front, <laughs> uh, <laughs> then... Uh, then you are very happy when the couple of thousand instructions were actually generated by a compiler uh -huh. uh, and you can easily change uh, yeah. uh, the code. Okay, so this is, yeah, I was trying to remember the name of the uh, the soft processor that Designlinks gives to. So it was not that. It was always very custom stuff, you're saying? Yeah, yeah, that that was always very custom stuff. Um, right. But that also means that I have some, some experience writing compilers, right? Uh -huh. um, right. And so I did also a couple of, of like toy open source projects around uh, compilers. Um, um, I wrote a couple of scripting languages uh, just just for me. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this is like a this is like a computer engineering like you know dream. All these things that you did for yourself, right? This is like what they all said that we would be doing. But only certain people like you did actually did all this stuff. So that's great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, uh, nobody is using any of the languages I think I, I, I built, um, uh, despite Open Escort, which I mean, those are languages I built, but I mean, the smaller things. Um, so, but, so like, what was the motivation behind building them? Was it just, just to get that, that experience, or was, did you actually use them as well? Yeah. Uh, I, I used them for a couple of things. So, SPL, for example, is one of the, uh, the scripting languages I, I wrote. Uh -huh. um, after I got very, very frustrated with Perl and decided I didn't want to use Perl anymore, but uh -huh. I still wanted to have a language that has a strong emphasis on um, regular expressions and uh, processing text and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Yep. So, um, so I built SPL and then then I used it for for some time, uh, but I'm not using it anymore. I'm doing everything in Python nowadays. Um, okay. But that definitely was a very, very interesting experience. And um, in a way, when someone is like learning computer science stuff, I, I would also always recommend to, to build your own uh, programming language. Um, but then Wait. don't expect anyone. But then <laughs> don't expect anyone to use it, and don't necessarily use it yourself after like <laughs> this. But but just going through the experience of, of doing uh, that uh, and okay. having to make all the design decisions uh, on your own. Uh -huh. Makes you really appreciate a lot of the stuff uh, the, that went into uh, the other programming language that you would then actually use for uh, for doing real world things. Um, but I, I wouldn't would... even know where to start if if someone said to write a new language. I, I mean, granted, okay, this is me, right? A hardware guy, like I'm a solder jockey, right? But like, where does one even start for that kind of thing? To to, to so like you you said, oh, I don't I don't like I don't like uh, Perl anymore. Now I'm going to write my own. What does that look like? What did you write the base language in? Um, well, um, I mean, it, it's hard if you never had had any experience with, with parsers yeah. and stuff like that. So yeah. when you do uh, computer science at university, uh -huh. uh, which I did not, uh, but 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 if you do it, uh, then uh, and if you're lucky, then you will have courses on things like uh, designing parsers and lexers, uh -huh. uh, and you know what what a grammar will look like and stuff like that. Um, and uh, yeah, so there, are, there okay. are, uh, you write a, a grammar usually, and then you run it through a tool that's called a parser generator uh, that will transform your grammar into, into program code uh, that can parse your language. Hmm. Um, and um, um, I'm, I'm oversimplifying now, but that... No, that, that's great, actually, <laughs> yeah. No, and and I, but, I probably shouldn't have even asked that question because, yeah, yeah of course, like, and, Chris, Chris is not going to know how to do this. I guess, I guess the real question is, though... Um, what what is the expected output of this? So now yeah. you have a new language, then what? I mean, like then you start. You said don't don't actually write with it. You're saying just kind of structure. It's almost like you're outlining a new language, but not using it. No, r r write it, use it for like half a year for for some toy project that you're not uh -huh. going to to maintain uh, twenty years from now. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> but, but but don't use it for that because I can guarantee you, uh, twenty years from now, someone will come to you and say, oh, there is a problem with this project you implemented back then. Right. Uh, and it's using this obscure program language right. that nobody knows anymore. And if you don't even fix yourself. it, I hate you, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so, yeah. So, so don't make your future self hate your, your present self. That's, that's, that's okay. usually that, a good, good... That's great advice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, so you said you didn't actually learn that. So how did you actually go about learning this stuff then? Was it mostly just a lot of Googling and 
trial and error? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, um, compilers was actually more like like reading books uh, okay. because I, I learned the compiler stuff um, around 2000. Um, okay, yep. So there was not uh, that much information online yet, or it was not that well structured. Um, or maybe I was not that much in the mindset yet that everything is online. Um, right. Yep, I, I don't yep, know. Yep. But, I, but I remember uh, spending many, many hours reading reading books on, on, on compiler design and stuff like that. Mm, okay. um, and actually, I can't recommend any 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 modern books because I read stuff like the Dragon Book back then um, because that was like the the, the reference, the, the classic. Which um, one? What is, it, what is it called again? Uh, the Dragon Book. Dragon Book. Okay. Um, it has on, on its cover, it has like a, a knight sitting in front of a computer terminal. Uh, and uh, on the screen of the computer terminal, you see the pixelated face of a dragon. Uh, and then you see the rest of the dragon come out the back of the monitor and it's becoming larger and larger. It actually goes around the cover and finishes on the other side of the book. And I think that's a, that's a great metaphor for uh, for what compiler design looks like. That you have like this, this very easy looking front end, but you have this huge dragon uh, behind it. Um, mm -hmm. But the, the thing, so uh, I just started saying, you write a compiler and that will give you an abstract syntax tree in some way and so forth. But the um, the important lesson is essentially you figure out a way to break down the problem of taking your input language and producing the output language uh -huh. into many, many small problems. Okay. And then you solve each of them individually. Uh, I mean, that's, <laughs> oh, that's, is that all I have to do? Yeah, okay. that, that's all you have to do. Um, and the, the hard part is not uh, writing all the small program snippets to do the individual uh -huh. problems. The hard part is knowing how you can break down the complex problem into smaller problems. Uh -huh. um, and that's uh, that's where it really helps to to read some 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 of the like classic literature. Uh -huh. uh, um, well, I, I'm sure there are a lot of texts online. How do you build your own language? Stuff like that. Sure. Sure. Um, yeah, you're saying just go go deep with the actual yeah. reference knowledge. Yeah. yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and you always okay. should should have a main focus on the data structures uh, okay. because so uh, usually you have something a data structure you put into your algorithm and the data structure that falls out of your algorithm. Mm -hmm. um, and in many cases, the problem is not really specifying what your algorithm should actually do, like on an instruction level, but uh -huh. figuring out what these data structures look like. Uh, yeah. And once you know what you want to convert into what, it's usually not that hard to write the actual code that does it. Got it. I mean, I think the, so like kind of piecing together your experience at the point you're talking about too, it seems like you have a strong Linux background, strong C background, but strong scripting background, all that stuff. But it, at this point, you, I mean, you also understood the underlying memory structures and the registers and everything down in the hardware level as well, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, at, at that point, on a on a very like um, abstract level. Um, oh, really? Okay, okay. So, so, so it wasn't like later on when, like, now that you do FPGA stuff, you're actually, you know, like, doing the register, you know, translating a piece of code into register gets designed and placed here, and well, this register inside an FPGA gets flipped to doing or lookup tables getting this value or something, right? Yeah, so so okay. when I started working with uh, uh, with FPGAs and started to build like my own processor, uh -huh. um, I I clearly was uh, 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 I, I was not sufficiently prepared to do that. Uh, so when okay. I started to write my first uh, compilers, I, I pretty much knew what I was doing. Um, but uh, with with the FPGA and hardware side of things, um, I. I probably just jumped into a couple of, of projects that in hindsight were a little bit too complex um, and then somehow managed to get something at the end anyways. <laughs> yeah. um, but um, but I mean, mo most projects I did back then were like just learning projects for me. Yeah, um, okay. And I think that's a, a very important point that in many companies, the only way how you can learn a new skill is by applying it in a project. Yep, um, I totally agree with that. And 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 that's horrible because that 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 project will <laughs> will not go very well if it's the right, first right. thing you do, right? You don't so, want much like depending on that one project, yeah. Yeah, so for, you, you you need to have some kind of 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 framework, some kind of context that that allows you to just play around with the technology first before actually deploying it right. in, in in something that uh, that matters. Right, um, it's, and it's a weird balance too because you want it to be enough where you're motivated by the end goal, 
but it's not the end goal is not like your job doesn't depend on it or your you know your future motivation doesn't depend on it and you're like okay with that failure and that iteration right yeah and you don't want uh people to uh to take on projects they're not actually qualified to do just because they say oh they want technology x y in their resume uh-huh. Uh, right. But they have no other means to get uh, the time and resources to get familiar with Project X Y right. uh, right. or Technology X Y. Um, yeah. So uh, um, and 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 for me that was just like playing around, learning new things, um, and I did not do anything like commercially with FPGAs until five years later. Oh wow! Okay, that's great. So uh, so, and w- what kind of job was this at? I mean, was this like a a uh, design house or something or what what were you doing otherwise to make to pay the bills versus playing around with FPGAs yeah so uh, for for uh pretty much the last 10 years i was uh helping to build uh 3d laser scanners um, oh really oh wow okay yeah so um so lidar uh a time of flight measurements mm-hmm. um and yeah as you can imagine there is a lot of of very um compute intensive dsp stuff uh yep, going yep. on um uh, primarily you're fighting two problems um the first one is that light is too fast um <laughs> i've noticed that they should slow it down yeah so the <laughs> light is too fast so so you can't just say oh when when did it become a little bit brighter and that was exactly when when the echo came back because oh, okay, then you know yeah. a distance maybe maybe on a one meter resolution or something like that mm-hmm. uh but instead you have to do a lot of, of, of processing and, and figuring out details uh, and the other problem is that light is too slow <laughs> i've noticed that they should change that <laughs> yeah uh, because uh because when you would like to do a couple of million measurements per second um and your target is sufficiently far away you are sending new pulses before the previous pulses come back oh yep. um so you need to figure out uh mechanisms to uh to know which pulse you received uh uh belongs to which pulse you sent that's um, why you always just send little arrows right so if you the arrow is pointing out then it's one <laughs> right? yeah right right, right. <laughs> um, um yeah so 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 I, and you could say that that a lot of my uh the work i did was uh was fighting these two problems that light is too okay. fast and that light is too slow <laughs> <laughs> that's great <laughs> Well, that I mean, obviously, that stuff is super in vogue right now with all the driving, self-driving cars, and just all the the mapping technologies that are out there. So, sounds yeah. like sounds like you were ahead of the game on a bunch of things these days. I, huh? I, I don't know. I don't know. I, I'm I'm personally not a big uh, believer in in lidar for self-driving cars. Interesting. I, I think uh, uh, passive technologies like just normal cameras uh-huh. uh, are, are probably much better. Uh, because uh, when you have an active technology, everyone is sending out their pulses. Uh, so now you don't only need to distinguish uh, the pulses you sent from each other, but also from the pulses other people send with, with their devices and things like that. Oh, it's, um, almost, it's almost like the opposite of a network effect where if you have more people in the system, it gets it degrades the quality of that system. Yes, yes. Oh. And also uh, cameras are really, really cheap. Um, <laughs> yep, yep. <laughs> and and And... Nowadays, computer vision is really, really good. Uh, yeah. So, uh, and it's only getting better. Um, so, um, so I think um, uh, lidar is very interesting for for stuff like mapping, where you have a car driving down the street once, and then you have like a very detailed three D model of everything in that street. Um, but for actual self driving cars, I'm I'm not I'm not convinced yet that that lidar will actually be the technology for that. Okay. Well, I mean, you're working on it, so I yeah, I'll, I'll take your word for it, you know. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was not really working on that. Uh oh, okay. I was uh that's the thing because I was I was uh I was working on on FPGA DSP course uh uh looking at waveforms. Um, oh, got it. Okay. And and uh I always say if you're really interested in like the application, then the job I did was the last job that you should ever do uh-huh. uh because uh I I do I did everything except anything to do with the actual application with like creating 3D uh, models of, of, of anything. And usually I only learned about applications of our devices um, when there was any problem in the field. Got um, it. And, and when everything was working fine, I was not even aware that, that we were doing this or that. 
So you're like the like like they used to say in like the old mobster movies. It's like the guy behind the guy behind the guy. <laughs> yeah, right. that's like you, except you know it's for technology. <laughs> right, right. In a way, in a way, yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so uh, so that was all that. Uh, okay. And then I started to go to university at um, 2008 or something like that. Uh -huh. uh, pretty late for me. Um, I first looked a little bit into computer science, then then decided uh, it's not really the thing uh, for me uh, because there were like, yeah, um, I, I, I felt like I know all this stuff already. Right. Um, I mean, it sounds like you kind of <laughs> were out in the world too. And I'm guessing that would probably, I mean, obviously I, I have very strong feelings on university versus like practical experience. It sounds like you were pretty much in the practical realm to start with. And then it would have been, you would have bumped up against that pretty hard. Yeah. And, and, and maybe it would have gone differently if, um, 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 if there wouldn't have been so many students per like professor or whatever in, uh -huh. in, in yep, computer yep. science. Uh, but, but, for me to get anything from from the experience, I would have needed like a very individual thing, right? Uh, because the thing that were a part of of the lectures and stuff were things that I, for the most part, already knew. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so I did. Uh, I, I what, looked into what, that. What, what yes. made you go back? I mean, I guess that's probably the big question there. Well, I didn't go back. Uh, oh, so oh I, this is continuing on. Sorry. So, so I I quit school when I was uh, fifteen. Uh, -huh. uh to uh to essentially uh, uh build the the technical backend for one of the first internet service providers in Austria wow um, okay uh which in so so in hindsight saying oh i quit school and, and everything will be fine was a very stupid idea uh but in my particular case and in that particular uh, point in time uh, uh, yeah. It turned out it was actually a very good uh, decision. Uh, yeah, but... I mean that's what I usually think. It's more like the opportunities there, and you had the knowledge, and there's just yeah. Why, I yeah. mean, like, but I can't recommend it time. to anyone now because like uh, the time is gone. And, right. and... <laughs> I would I wouldn't recommend starting an ISP to anyone now, right? You know, yeah, so, right. Oh, okay, that that no, that those time has passed. But, uh, I mean that puts you also like so like you've done that. I think Alan Yates uh, did an ISP at one point. One of our past guests, uh, Sammy did. Uh, Sammy Camcar did a. A VoIP startup doing kind of the same kind of stuff, so that that doesn't surprise me at all. Like, I mean, that's yeah. great. Yeah. So. so, but that means I never finished school. Uh, uh -huh. I never started university. Uh -huh. um, and then, uh, two thousand eight, uh, I made all the tests that you need to do in order to go to university, even though you did not finish school. Uh -huh. um, and then I started, uh, 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 um, yeah, um, trying trying to study computer science. Um, but then I very quickly switched to electrical engineering um, yeah. because I thought, well, there is like more for me um, to explore. That's yeah, new. Yeah. I mean, if you don't mind me asking, is it, uh, was it the, was the lack of degree limiting at a certain point? Like um, as like a gating mechanism? Um, well, I can't think of, of a few situations where it was, uh -huh. uh, but then again, in hindsight, I'm, I'm not quite sure if I would uh, have liked to really have this, this kind of, um, opportunities anyway, uh -huh. uh, because if uh, uh, if it's really a problem that I don't have a degree, and I think they don't really know. Right, right. They haven't looked at your past work. Right. No, yeah, I totally I mean, agree. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, it's right. just again that this is this is a theme that has come up, like Jack Gansel as well, Jerry Ellsworth. I mean, like a bunch of people in a similar situation. Um, you know, like didn't finish degrees, whatever, but. But at a certain point, it it's an interesting like paradox because the the lack of degree sometimes prevented certain jobs from happening or like from certain opportunities. But at the same time, then then that was the hack that was needed where they're like, well, I'll just go and do consulting on this interesting thing or that interesting thing. I'll teach myself this, and it's almost like it's cause and effect type stuff. And that's and that's the only reason I ask. Um, yeah, that's yeah. great. Uh, interestingly, in Austria, degrees are like a, a very important thing socially. Right. Um, yes. Yeah, so yeah. I wouldn't uh, uh, be able to think of any particular like business opportunity, uh -huh. um, but I don't know if if you like to uh, um, to move your dentist appointment on short notice, and you you have a no. doctor to your name, uh -huh. uh, that will change a lot. And no. and if you're just a, a <laughs> normal guy, uh, they will give you a lot of heat for it. Um, and that's, that's, a, that's a very, very strange thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, what? Um, and it's a very Austrian thing. So. <laughs> okay. All right. All right. 
Chalk that one up to Austria. <laughs> oh, yeah, Clifford's in Austria. If people didn't figure that out, yeah. <laughs> Probably should have said that yeah. at the top. Then. Yeah. Oh, that's cool. Okay. Yeah. All right, so, yeah, okay. university. Uh, so you're so, doing so, EE so, stuff then. That's great. Yep. Yes. And uh, um, I have to say I, I didn't... Um, um, in one way, I was a very good student because I, I got only A's um, mm -hmm. and one B. Um, and at the other end, I was a very bad student because after I got the B, I couldn't go to, to exams anymore. Um, so <laughs> Wait, what? <laughs> it's just like a psychological blockage. Um, and actually, the A's were also pretty hard because I, I got the A, but in, in my own uh, um, opinion, I always felt like, like I failed. Right. Um, because like, I got like... something wrong that, that was so obvious and stuff like that. And I think that's a problem when you're working in the industry for, for 20 years and then uh -huh. going to university. Because in the industry, um, you don't get uh, easy problems. Right. But then strange artificial restrictions, like you must not use any, any special tools or outside help. Uh, and it must all be finished in 30 minutes uh, right. and stuff like that. <laughs> right. um, but then in the industry, you can't come back and say the answer is two when in fact the answer is five. <laughs> no one is going to say, yeah, well, but but actually you demonstrated some basic knowledge of the things right, that work. Right, right, right. Did you show your work? No. It, <laughs> yeah. So it's, it's, it's yeah, that, that's, and, and that was a big issue for me uh, right. because I got an A, but I got the answer two instead of the answer five. Right, uh, because right. time was uh, uh, was so restricted that I did not really have uh, enough time to like check all the signs in my calculation uh, or right. something stupid like that. Got um, it. And uh, and I'm just imagining I'm imagining then, a situation in industry where it's like, well, boss, I showed all my work here, and so I think I should get that raise. And they're like, the bridge fell down, <laughs> you're fired. Yeah, you right. know? <laughs> yeah, um, and and. Uh, and I think some people can can make this transition uh, to uh -huh. this different system, but but I I, I was not really able to do it. Um, mm -hmm. And um, but nevertheless, uh, I was at university, and so I had uh, uh, made some contacts to people at university. And the oh, great, great thing in Austria is that we don't really pay um, a lot in in terms of tuition or something like that. Yeah. Um, since a couple of years, we we have to pay something now, but it's like uh, uh, five hundred euros a semester or something yeah, like that. Yeah. Um, um, so you you can afford staying uh, at university for like two more years without actually going to any exams um, <laughs> and still staying in touch with people. You right. couldn't really do that if you're like Stanford or, right. or, or whatever. $80,000 a year, like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it would, would ruin you. Um, yeah. so, so even though I did not really uh, uh, finish uh, any, any EE degree, I got in touch with a lot of people at the uh, EE institutes and I started to publish papers with them. Uh, yeah. which uh, uh, turned <laughs> out to great. be quite fun, actually. Yeah. Um, and and one of the research projects that I was uh, involved uh, was in cost grain reconfigurable architectures. Um, so it, it, think of it like of like an FPGA, but instead of operating on single bits, it is operating on whole words. And it can do operations like addition and subtraction and multiplication. Um, or even more complex operation in a single like like primitive cell. So the architecture that we had, for example, had a cell type that could take the absolute value of the difference of two numbers and then check if that uh, difference is greater uh, than than a certain threshold. Um, huh. And that's a single and, operation, though. Is that the idea? And that's a single operation in that architecture. Okay. Yes. Wow. Um, okay. Which is quite funny because when you write code. Uh, usually you write like one operator in your code yeah, and right. it's translated to many, many very, very small fine-grained cell types. Right. And in this case, the compiler would need to uh, uh, recognize a certain constellation of operators and uh -huh. say, oh, this set of operators implement that primitive operation that I, yeah. I, I can uh, uh, do with this hardware primitive. Um, wow. Yeah, so uh, so uh, a PhD student at the university uh, uh, looked into this kind of architectures, um, and um, and uh, essentially he wanted me to uh, to write a a tool for a domain specific language that would allow to design things in that architecture. Um, 
And the, the, the overall goal was when this tool would be available, then we would get a, a, a bachelor student or something like that and let them write uh, test cases for this architecture um, as bachelor thesis or whatever. Um, mm -hmm. And then we could evaluate how good the architecture is. Um, and I first wrote this tool because I didn't want any discussion about that. And it was very easy to write it. Um, and, and then I said, so here is the tool. But actually, we, do, we should not use a DSL. We should just pass uh, a subset of regular Verilog um, and infer the primitives from that. Um, and the guy at university essentially said, uh, 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 I'm not going to stop you, but you will fail. Uh, this is this is <laughs> ridiculous. <laughs> I will challenge um, you directly, person who likes challenging, being challenged directly. <laughs> <laughs> yes, right. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, so, so I sit, sat down, and, and and after two months or something like that, I had something that would actually work better than the DSL that we had before. Um, and yeah, that was the start of Yosis. Um, I'm seeing, I'm seeing a theme here. I have to say, <laughs> that's great. So that's Yosis. Okay, I think it's so, a theme with most of your guests, right? <laughs> I, I, yeah, you, 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 yeah. Having talked to many of them, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's that certain something, you know. It's yeah. Yeah, it's great. So I it's amazing. This program, <laughs> yeah, I had this program now, Yosis, that was capable of doing um, uh, this coarse grain synthesis tasks. Uh, and so, I realized, yes. Okay. What, what, what is, so, like, if you had to summarize Yosis in a in a sentence, what would it, would it just be the coarse grain, grain reconfiguration, re reconfigurable architecture? Or is it something broader? No. So it's it's uh, uh, the name Yosis stands for Yosis Open Synthesis Suite. Um, okay. And I would say it's like a framework for for HDL synthesis and more. Okay. And and at the moment, I would say the and more part is is maybe even larger. Uh, than the explicit part, the, the, the HDL synthesis part. Uh -huh. okay. um, but it started out as this framework for coarse grain uh, synthesis. And then I realized to do like regular, proper, fine grain synthesis, the thing that everyone else is doing, I did not need to add that much to, to Yosis. Um, so I added that just, just uh, because I could. Uh, yeah. And then I started downloading uh, very log examples from the app. Um, and uh, very often I found something that almost worked with users. There was only one Verilog feature missing. So I just implemented that feature. Uh, but after I've implemented that feature, now another project was, was really close to that point where I could almost process it with users. Only one Verilog feature was missing. So I implemented that feature. Uh -huh. um, and, and like that over the years, or over the course of maybe two years, so I pretty much implemented the complete Verilog 2005 uh, standard. Um, or everything that is used by, by code out there in the wild. Um, because I always found another project that I only needed to invest maybe two hours to implement this one feature. It was like almost like machine learning where you kept throwing real world examples. It was like, I mean, I know that this is just regular learning, but like <laughs> machine learning, I think about like, it just, you keep showing it different examples and it, you'd keep trying things and until you get rid of all the errors. Um, you might miss one or two of the small errors, but that's not. I mean, that's always an issue. Yeah, um, 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 it, it's like a different thing, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying to okay. find the, uh, the name for it in my head. Um, uh -huh. um, um, it's definitely an iterative approach for, I mean, for no, no doubt about that. But yeah. So in, in machine learning, you have this technique where you um, start out with very small examples and then make the examples more and more complex. Uh, so uh -huh. you do that, for example, when you would like to build a robot that can find its way in a maze. Yeah, um, right. And if you just drop it in a really, really huge maze, it will just randomly go around. And uh, the best reinforcement learning algorithm will not be actually able to, uh, um, to figure out what was the right behavior that made the robot solve the maze. Um, so you start out with small mazes and then make the mazes larger and larger and larger, and then you can use reinforcement learning for something like that. Uh, Got it. But actually, wouldn't want so we could <laughs> let, let's talk about machine learning another time because machine machine okay. learning is also a topic for me. Uh, God, oh, jeez, of course it is. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so I have I have a different question then. So um, so could you explain what synthesis is, right? So people might not know what that actually means in the first place. So you're starting with Verilog, and then what is it doing to it? Yeah, I mean. Um, um, synthesis is used in so many contexts, right? 
uh, yeah, for yep. you, you create something uh, essentially, or you have a program create something. Um, and with logic synthesis, you have a pro program generating um, a logic circuit um, that might be made out of gates or uh, lookup tables or other logic primitives. Um, and you have some kind of uh, of description what the logic should look like, uh, usually as as HDL code. Um, so um, um, so you might have like an adder in your HDL code, and then the synthesis tool might translate that to a dedicated adder primitive for coarse grain synthesis, for example. Uh, it might turn that into a chain of carry cells uh, in an FPGA-based uh, uh, synthesis approach. It might turn it into NAND gates and NOR gates for an ASIC uh, uh, uh -huh. synthesis uh, task. Um, but, but whatever your architecture is, you have some kind of architecture that allows you to implement logic circuits, and you have some description uh, that tells the tool what kind of logic function you would like to calculate. Um, and the synthesis tool bridges uh, these two worlds. Um, hmm. And you could call a compiler, for example, a assembler program synthesizer. But it's pretty huh. much the I same like thing. It, it takes a, yeah. a high-level description or higher-level description in one uh, format and performs a sequence of transformations to uh, create the, the, the equivalent representation in a format that you can actually work with. Uh, so when you have a program, uh, you compile it into machine language, into assembler programs. Um, if you have a circuit, you start out with something like the HDL description and you end up with NAND and NOR gates if you're building an ASIC. Mm, okay. Um, and so what, what is the actual output of Yosis then? Is it like a, a separate like uh, language? Because it's not actually targeting any logic at this point, right? Yeah, I mean, at, at, at this point, um, we are targeting the cross grain stuff. Um, and there uh -huh. is a, a framework in Yosis that allows you to express what your cross grain architecture can actually do. Um, uh -huh. And then it will know what kind of thing to generate. Um, for the coarse grain synthesis, I actually wrote a interconnect generator uh, for coarse grain architectures um, that's called um, intersynth. Has even synth the name because it, it generates an interconnect, so it's an interconnect synthesizer. Um, okay. And that has a netlist format that users can generate. Uh, but I think the only person using that or ever used that was this one PhD student who, who worked on the cost grain architecture. Um, there are a couple of different file formats uh, for, for logic circuits. Um, and, and users can generate uh, a, a whole bunch of them uh, and can also read a few of them. Um, and yeah. Um, it, are there some examples of those that I'm, people might recognize? Um, EDIF, for example, uh, so okay. EDIF is uh, a, a format that's, that's in very widespread use in the industry. Uh, BLIF, B-L-I-F, the Berkeley Logic Interchange format, is... Uh, oh, those Berkeley folks, yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's a format <laughs> that's very uh, popular with open source tools. Yep. Um, I, of course, I can generate uh, Verilog again. Um, and uh, amazingly, a lot of industry tools uh, process as so place and route tools and stuff like that process as inputs very very simple strict subsets of of structural Verilog. Um, oh, interesting. Um, so that's also an option. Um, I I would need to like open the users help page to go through the entire list. Uh, okay. But but that's there are a right. couple yeah. of, of formats. There is a JSON format that is very users uh, specific um, to make sure that we have something that is on the one hand easy to pass. But at the other hand, it's not really losing any information in a way that would right. be avoidable. Um, right, because if you have like a super custom coarse grain thing, you want to be able to say, well, you might not know what this, you know, ABC adder is, but that's what it is. And yeah, it, it's more it like <laughs> uh, when, I, when you have a file format that users can, for example, write and read. Uh, uh -huh. And you, uh, in a loop, write it, read it, write it, read it, write it, read it, without uh -huh. running any optimizations in between, uh, then your design could become bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Um, and maybe it's just because it adds additional wires that are aliases for the wires that are already there and and, and things like that. Um, so, uh, 
and and the JSON format does not have this uh, this issue. Um, and it's used for tools that uh, uh, are used in flows after Yosus, but are written specifically to be used with Yosus. And so in Got that it. case, okay. uh, it would be ridiculous to generate an output format uh, that does not exactly represent the internal representation Yosus is using. Uh, and then read that format in, a set, in another tool that now has to pass a more complex format because it passes this other thing instead of the, the JSON output we generate. Um, so there are a couple of tools out there that can process users JSON files. Very cool. So, okay, so now you're in this new format or you know, maybe even if you're back into Verilog. So this is something that you would actually then target at a processor or what is the, what is the next step if you're gonna take this, you're, you're trying to go from Verilog and you're trying to target a processor or target an FPGA? Yeah, so if you target an FPGA, uh, then, um, um, then you would need to do place and route next uh, because the output of yours is only a so-called net list. Um, so it's the list of all the gates that you have in your circuit and uh, uh, the list of pins on those gates that need to be connected to each other. Um, but it has no uh, a placement geometry, geometry information. Um, so it doesn't know where which gate will go on the actual device. Um, and the placer uh, does exactly that. The placer figures out where to place all the individual gates so that the things that are, uh, are tightly connected to each other also end up being close to each other on the actual FPGA device. Um, right. Otherwise, you would need to route signals all the way back and forth uh, through the chip. Um, and yeah, I mean, it's the same when you when you build a, 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 a PCP. Uh, yeah, if I was going to make that comparison. Randomly, yeah. <laughs> if you just randomly throw the components on the PCP, you probably won't be able to route it. Um, right. So the placer figures out a good placement, um, and then the router tries to actually make those uh, connections. Right, and there's only so many fixed paths, so like it's like a crosshatch of, of potential pl ways to get from one point, yes, point A to point yes. B, right? I mean, uh, um, interconnect is the thing where different FPGAs um, make uh, slightly different design decisions or even vastly different design decisions, but uh, but as first approximation, it's something like that, um, right. where you have uh, certain lines and certain points where those lines cross, um, and if a line is used for one signal, it can't be used for another signal. Um, and uh, yeah, you have uh, rip up routers that essentially try to, to route some nets, but then they figure out, oh, I can't route these other nets now. So they rip up the nets they have routed before to route the new net. And uh, when you iterate over this uh, for a certain amount of time, you hopefully end up with something where every signal is routed. Yeah. And the uh, 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 different algorithms you could use for all of that. Um, and the vendors usually write tools for their own devices there. Right. Um, so uh, you would use a, a tool from Xilinx for the Xilinx part, a tool from Altera or Intel for the um, Intel FPGAs, a, a tool from, I don't know, uh, MicroSame for the MicroSame FPGAs, from Govin for the Gomi 7 FPGAs and all that stuff. Nice. Um, but the synthesis part is usually uh, something they buy from somewhere else. Um, so the two big players are the exception here. So uh, uh, Xilinx and Altera or Intel. <laughs> um, <laughs> the, yeah, that, that's like uh, burned into my head. Um, yeah, right. <laughs> by, 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 by the time I, uh, I get, I'm getting used to saying Intel, they have probably sold the entire that's right, FPGA to the division. Next one. Yep, to the next yep. one, yeah. Yeah, I still call it <laughs> Actel. I don't call it Micro Semi, you know. <laughs> Yeah, 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 and 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 uh, do you still say Agilent? Uh yeah. Well, if I don't say HP, yeah. Yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so, so you're saying the the other synthesis tools? So, synthesis tools are are not. So, those are usually not written by the companies themselves. Yes, they they are usually bought from from other companies, um, oh. and then uh, multiple FPGA FPGA uh, design environments will actually use the same synthesis tool. Uh, from the same synthesis tool vendor. Um, yeah, I have and, used Simplicity or Simplify Pro, Simplicity at yes, some point. Yes, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Okay. That's 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 the kind of tools. Okay. Um, and in in flows like that, users uh, can uh, almost always uh, replace something like uh, Simplicity. Uh -huh. um, um, I'm, I'm not saying that we generate like equally good results. 
Um, but uh, but you because can... there's like an interchange format, you're saying that that's that's like yes, it's yes. very easy to determine. Yeah, like and and and, and usually the FPGA architectures are similar enough to each other uh, that it's uh, uh, easy to to write all the descriptions for another FPGA FPGA right. architecture for users and then uh, then use it. Right. I always um, remember people talking about like the like Xilinx stuff has like custom types of logic internally, right? Like they have ones that if you target th that specific logic, it would work on their parts, but it wouldn't work on another, like an Altera part. Yes, yes. So for yeah. example, the the way um, adder chains are built are slightly different on each FPGA. Uh -huh. um, but then uh, um, wherever you go, you have something to build an adder chain. Uh, so all you need to do is tell users how to build an adder chain on this architecture. Uh -huh. um, okay. And the way yours is built, you can actually do that with uh, with uh, with small Verilog code snippets. Um, so if you already know how to write Verilog code, you know everything uh, at least language-wise that you need to know how to retarget users. Got it. Okay. So what is the what is the place in route tool then? So Yosis gets to this interchange form edif, blif, Verilog, JSON, whatever. Then it's doing place in route. Is that a separate tool? Yes, and that's a separate tool, usually written by the FPGA vendor. Um, oh, and, okay. And that was more or less the state at maybe uh, 2013. Uh -huh. um, and um, I always thought, uh, wouldn't it be great if we would have like open documentation for the bitstream formats and stuff like that? Right. Yep. Uh, so that we can build actual open source place and route tools for all these architectures. Um, and... Uh, um, when I did talk to people from from the major vendors, I pretty much always got the same answer. Um, <laughs> no. <laughs> yes, yes. But, uh, I mean, the no is a cultural thing, right? They don't yeah. even think about the reasons. Right. But then they have to like uh, construct a reason. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> right. And... Because previously they've been like, "Well, what are you going to do with it?" Right. And now it's like, "Well." We're going to do something with it, but yeah. are we allowed so, to do that? <laughs> so, so the reason uh, I always got was even if the vendor would release the documentation, we wouldn't have the uh, the resources and the, the knowledge to actually build place and route tools, um, <laughs> because you need like a hundred PhDs uh, and and a billion dollars to to build a place and route tool. That, that sounds uh, like a challenge to me. I'm just saying, you know. Yeah, yeah, right. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, so, uh, so it became pretty clear that uh, uh, in order to have a good argument for releasing bitstream formats, uh, we first have to demonstrate that we actually can write good place and route tools. Um, and in order to do that, we had to reverse engineer bitstream format. Um, so uh, that's that's pretty much what I did. Um, um, so that's Project Ice Storm. We took the Ice 40 FPGA from Lattice. Uh, and that's a relatively small FPGA, and it has a, a very, very regular structure. Um, uh, so you don't have like uh, a thousand different uh, um, special function units that have their own kind of configuration. Uh, all you have in an ICE-40 FPGA, so the, the ones we targeted initially, the LP and HX series, mm -hmm. uh, are, are lookup tables. Uh, flip flops, uh, carry uh, cells, some block run primitives, and I/O blocks, and also a PLL. Um, so I uh, spent, um, yeah, uh, a large portion of 2015 <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, um, working on that, uh, reverse engineering the bitstream. Oh, sorry, documenting the bitstream. Uh -huh, um, yep. Um, I've recently learned that uh, that for lawyers, reverse engineering actually means like disassembling something. Uh -huh. uh, but that's not what I did. I just threw things at the, at the vendor tools and then looked at the output files they generated. Right, um, right. And I mean, for, for most engineers, this is reverse engineering, but apparently for lawyers, it's not. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Um, so I, I, we documented the bitstream format, uh, and uh, we we created the user's backend for that. Um, and uh, Cotton Seed wrote uh, uh, a place and route tool for it called Arachne PNR. And uh, so by um, mid 2015, we had a complete open source uh, tool chain for this uh, Lattice i 40 FPGAs. Um, that's pretty killer. Yeah, that's 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 the first I got to say. <laughs> yeah, that was great. Uh, so 
Uh, later, we added support for the larger 8K devices. Um, just recently, um, we uh, we added added support for uh, Ultra Plus uh, uh, devices. Uh, David did that, uh, and uh, yeah. So so we and have so a, are, are the methods the same when each each next thing you have to document of the bit streams is it. Is it the same kind of like iterative, like try file one, see what the bitstream is, try file two, see what the bitstream is, change this, change that, see what the uh, output is? Pr pretty much. I mean, the okay. method is the same for all um, IS-40 uh, devices. Um, uh -huh. It's a little bit different for the Xilinx devices, um, but uh, but we're not there yet in the history, right? Uh -huh. <laughs> we are just in 2015. Right. <laughs> oh, true, true. I see, I see. <laughs> and, 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 and just real quick, the uh, can you explain what the bitstream actually is? Because... I know what it is, but well, I think sure. I know what it is, but yeah. Um, I mean, it's a it's a binary configuration file that tells the device what to do. Um, and as as far as most users are concerned, it's just a huge binary blob that the vendor tool will generate, um, and that you can only use as is. So usually there is there is no meaningful way to make a modification to bitstreams, for example. Right. Um, but. Uh, uh, yeah, there are also some some uh, scientific publications on the way uh, regarding making meaningful uh, changes to bit streams to activate yeah. trojans and stuff like that. Oh, really? Um, Interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So that's okay. that that that's one of the topics that right. I uh, I publish on with the people from from TU Vienna oh, is okay. uh, hardware trojans and um, uh, trigger for hardware trojans and stuff like that. Um, and okay. when you when you think <laughs> about the security of FPGA devices. It really helps a lot if you can tell what the individual bits in the bitstream do. Mm -hmm. um, um, also because that then allows you to actually demonstrate the possible attacks and not right. just um, uh, speculate about what could theoretically be possible. Right. I mean, what do they do now? It's just like they have the bitstream itself, and then they have like a hash on the bitstream to see if it's actually all adds up is that kind of the only real security device right now yeah i mean most bitstreams don't have any security at all I mean, really? there's just a csc on it to make sure that there are no transmission errors but uh -huh. that's not really that's not even a hash or anything yeah. um um and the um the idea pretty much is that it would be so complicated to document the bitstream uh, that nobody would be able to do it anyway. So it's essentially by obscurity. Yeah, right. Uh, that, <laughs> and that, of course, historically never worked. Um, right. When I originally released Project Ice Storm, uh, the first thing that I released was just a tool that could look at the bitstream and produce an equivalent Verilog source code oh from the bitstream. <laughs> um, because that's that's great for a verification loop. So what I try with all yeah. projects like that is to right, automate right. as much as possible. Uh, although that makes it much more reproducible when other people can like run the same scripts and stuff like that. Yeah. Yep. Um, and 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 the most important thing is that you have a uh, 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 continuous uh, checking and rechecking yep. if the things that you think you found out are correct. Yep. Uh, because if you go down uh, a, an incorrect path and work on on, on with with incorrect assumptions, uh, then it will become super hard to to document an FPGA bitstream. Um, so whenever you have a theory, you should write some kind of small program that uh, um, that in one way or another tries to check if your theory is correct. Um, and what I did with the i forty was I generated thousands and thousands of of random programs, random Verilog designs. Uh, and then I synthesized them all with the vendor tools. And then I extracted the circuit from the bitstream with this other tool. And then I checked if the extracted uh, uh, circuit from the bitstream is equivalent to the original auto-generated circuit. Right. Um, and if this is true for thousands and thousands of auto-generated designs, then you have uh, high confidence that actually your model of what the individual bits and the bitstream do is correct. Right. Yep. Um, I kind of think of it like uh, doing, if you did like Google Translate, so if you went from German to English to German to English to German to English, if it's the same phrase each and every time, well, for a, a range of phrases, then the, the translation is perfect. Now, obviously, there's a little bit more nuance in language. Yeah, but like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So so, uh, so in language, I think this is like the, the ultimate goal that is unreachable. Uh, but with with uh, with logic uh, yeah. uh, gate circuits and FPGA bitstreams, um, this is essentially the only acceptable thing. 
Yeah, uh, right. <laughs> you're right. If, it's in the if, name, logic. Yeah. If, if there is, if there is only, if there's only one very, very small uh, deviation between what you got out and what you started with, uh, behaviorally, yes. uh, then uh, then there is a bug somewhere in 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 your documentation or in your tools. Um, yeah. And, and so because that was an, an inherent part of the process that I used to uh, to do the actual documenting, um, uh, because of that, it was like the first thing that I could release. Um, and immediately, I, I got very, very angry email from, from people. From um, Lattice? Is this no, when no, you started not, talking not, to lawyers? <laughs> not, not from Lattice, from, okay. from, from random people. Uh, who said uh, uh, very unfriendly things, oh. um, and and seemed to like work under the assumption uh, that I like to steal their IP in particular. Um, oh. <laughs> because oh, that's, that's some ego coming through in the email. Huh? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. And uh, my only theory about that is, uh, and so I've been in a couple of of companies that uh, had discussion about how can we protect our IP and stuff like that. And there is always one person who said, well, I don't need to think that we need to do anything because it would be too complicated for anyone to actually uh -huh. make sense of the bits in the bit stream. Right. Um, and I would assume that uh, that one guy was did this guy in a meeting like two days before my my uh, initial release was published <laughs> on Hackaday. Uh, and like he said, oh, nobody can do that. And like right, the right. next day. Uh, I am invincible. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So yeah, so, so, so I, I have not replied to the emails. Uh, I, I don't know what the actual story is, uh, but but to me that sounds like a very reasonable uh, explanation. Yeah, right. Um, or or some variation on it, right? Because it probably yeah, happened right. multiple times, right? Where <laughs> if you got more than one email, it's a bunch of people are like, oh, you've just ruined my worldview. Yeah. Wow. Um, so by the beginning of 2016, I, I was pretty much finished with with the original ICE 40 stuff. The last thing I had to do was uh, timing analysis, um, and that was done in January 2016. Um, and yeah. yeah, that's and that's good. I mean, you've worked, we kind of walked us through all of the tools that uh, FPGA Flow does, anyways, right? So you have going from you know, a, a language like Verilog to the logic blocks, you do the place and route, or so you have, uh, what was the next step? So the next step is actually, yeah, place and route is next, right? Then you need to do timing to make sure everything gets from point A to point B if you want to make a mega, 100 megahertz clock or something like that. Yes. You, yeah, you need to make sure you can get all the way across the chip and everything hits hits the hits the mark. And uh, and then what? Then you actually have to just generate the final bit stream and shove it into the, to the, uh, to the, to the FPGA, right? Right, that's it. And we have open source tools for each and every of those steps. Um, that's so crazy. That's a complete thing. <laughs> um, yeah. and, and, and we can do a couple of things that the vendor tools can't do. Uh, for example, um, I can take a bitstream file, um, convert it into our own ASCII representation, uh, and then run timing analysis on that. Uh, the vendor tools don't allow you that. You, you can't run timing analysis on a bitstream with, with the vendor tools. Um, Interesting. So if if you have some outside entity and they make it designed for you, uh, and you say, yeah, it must run with 100 megahertz, but for like, I don't know, copyright reasons, they only give you the bitstream and they don't uh -huh. give you anything else, you can't actually check if the timing goal is reached, right? Yeah. Yeah, you can now. <laughs> Wow. So is that because you were perfectly recreated, and that's because of the perfect recreation of the Verilog or logic elements from the bitstream? Is that the idea? Yeah. I mean, it's it, it's using a different different flow, uh, uh -huh. but the main reason is I need a way to actually verify that my timing analysis is correct. Uh -huh. So what do I do? I run timing analysis with the vendor tools for a design. Again, a randomly generated design, um, and then I store the bitstream. And then I run my timing analysis on that bit stream. So now I've run the vendor timing analysis and my timing analysis on the same design. Oh, I and see. And I can see. compare if they produce the same results within a few picoseconds. Got it. Yep. Um, and they do. So I know my timing analysis is sound. Right. So if they would have just given you, <laughs> if they would have just given, documented their own bitstream, you never would have had to make all these tools that made everybody so upset. You know, it's their, yeah, it's, yeah, their, it's their yeah. fault. <laughs> <laughs> I, and I that's think, why people should be more open. <laughs> I think the main point here is that uh, um, most of this stuff was was like me more or less in my spare time, uh, plus a handful of other people uh, are helping with various uh, things. Some of them are large things like like 
Cotton wrote the entire Arachne Pianato, which was very impressive. Um, and uh, and Dave Shaw did the entire uh, Ultra Plus recently. I had I didn't need to do anything for that. Um, but but it's a very very small group of people um, with uh, very limited resources, um, and it was not that hard actually. Um, so if for example a large uh, Chinese corporation doing industrial espionage or whatever, uh -huh. uh, they they would have no problem doing something similar. Right, um, right. So, People get mad because you've made it available to them. It's like, well, they might have already done it and just not published about yes, it. Yes, so, right, right. Yeah. They, they have no reason to publish any of that. But, right. but I don't think that... I would actually be surprised if we really be the, the very first group to do that. Uh, for this FPGA. Yeah. Um, I know that other people did similar things for Xilinx FPGAs in the past. Yeah. Um, so um, um, so we're actually not the first one. So as, as some of uh, your listeners might know, we are right now working on, on doing the same thing for Xilinx 7 Series FPGAs. Oh, nice. Um, and a couple of weeks ago, we, uh, we released the first Bitstream documentation. Um, so if you always wanted to know what, what this or that bit in your bitstream does, then now you can go to a web page and look it up. Uh, but right. uh, so far we don't have the tools finished. So right now we are working a lot of uh, on, 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 on the tools, but it's all on the way. And I guess uh, uh, many people would say that um, actually documenting the bitstream is, is the hardest bit. Yeah, okay. Um, so we've done that, um, at least for the... Uh, the basic logic cells and uh, the CLBLM uh, tiles. And that's most of the, the FPGA and the interconnect tiles. Uh, we know them, but we don't have uh, a detailed bitstream documentation yet for DSP slices, for block RAMs, and then for all like IO related stuff uh, uh -huh. uh, and, and things like that. Uh, okay. But the nice thing about Xilinx 7 series is that Xilinx 7 series uh, allows partial reconfiguration. So oh, you really? can okay. you can define uh, a certain area on your chip and say, oh, this is now my FPGA within the FPGA, and you yeah. generate bit streams that only update this this particular area, um, huh. and you can still interact with the rest of the the FPGA. Um, so this is our first target for Xilinx Seven series. We don't need to actually generate a complete bit stream for the entire device. Um, we could have a kind of harness and synthesize the harness in the vendor tools. Um, yeah. And that harness contains a reconfigurable section. And then we use our open source tools to reconfigure that reconfigurable section. And I actually right. think that for this, there are much more like industrial use cases than for actually replacing the vendor tools with the open source tool chains. Um, I would imagine that, uh, especially in the near future, um, mo most people would not see any advantage to, to replacing the vendor tools completely. Um, but the interesting thing is our tools are open source tools. Uh, when you have something like a Tsync FPGA that has an embedded ARM processor that runs Linux, you can uh -huh. run all our tools on that ARM processor and build a oh, bit stream on demand in the device <laughs> to do exactly what you want to do. I mean, that's the dream. That is the dream. And so one of the and then you have like so basically it's like a prototyping area, but in an FPGA, right? That's the idea. Is like the that little playground area is what you can yes. make the yes. you can use the arm to make the tools to to play around in that little sandbox. Yes. And so I'm a strong believer that uh, when you uh, when you create the tools, you don't know all the applications yet. And I think it's the same thing here. That that most of the of the most astonishing killer applications that will come from that are things uh -huh. that I can't even dream. Yeah. Um, but I can give you one uh, one example uh, where this could be useful, and it's okay. in a logic analyzer. So uh, when you have a logic analyzer, you usually have a uh, means to define very very complex trigger conditions. Uh -huh. um, and those trigger conditions are, of course, implemented using a trigger unit that you build in the FPGA uh, that are, is very configurable. Um, yeah. So in a way, you just build a reconfigurable architecture in a reconfigurable architecture. It's a, a ginormous waste of resources. Um, <laughs> um, 
and it's not going to be as fast uh, or as flexible as if you could uh, just expose all the flexibility from the underlying uh, uh, reconfigurable architecture, the FPGA itself. Uh, so what we could do instead is if when the when the user clicks on acquire, we take the trigger condition, uh, translate it into a logic circuit, synthesize the logic circuit, place and route it for this reconfigurable architecture, generate the bitstream, and then program the bitstream. Um, and uh, but you could you couldn't do that with the vendor tools. Even if Xilinx would would open source all their tools tomorrow, you still could not do it because their tools are so optimized to a different scenario. The, when, when you start up Vivado, it, it, it's not uncommon for it to, to think for a couple of minutes before you can interact with the tool at all. <laughs> right, um, right. And I mean, that's, that's fine if you start Vivado in the morning and then two times more over the course of the day after it crashed. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but... Uh, and it's okay if you have synthesis jobs that, that take hours and hours because they're huge designs. Um, mm -hmm. But with this partial reconfiguration area, we are looking at a, a very, very small FPJ in the end because this area is very, very small. Um, like, like how many logic blocks would you imagine would be in there? Uh, I mean, you can, you, can, you can choose whatever you want. Uh, but just to give you a data point, um, the um, ICE 41K has, has 1,000 logic cells. Uh, so 1,000 lookup tables, 1,000 flip-flops, uh, stuff like that. Uh -huh. 1,200 something, but uh, who counts? Um, and uh, um, for small designs, we can go from Verilog to Bitstream in less than a second. Whoa. Um, for large designs, we're actually a little bit slower than the vendor tools. But for slow design, for, for, for small designs, we are super optimized. And this is also great for stuff like workshops. Uh, when we do workshops, people can like make small changes to the design, click one button, and immediately see the result in hardware, uh, and don't yeah. need to like wait for three minutes for right. the design chain to change to go through. Um, mm -hmm. And when you, uh, for an experienced FPGA engineer, this is not an issue because the experienced FPGA engineer isn't isn't synthesizing. Most of the time, uh, most of the time you're just simulating. You're working on, on individual cores, uh, and then when you synthesize your whole design, it will take a day or something like that, anyways. Um, so, so if you like to do like iterating on small changes by testing it in hardware, you're then doing something completely wrong. Uh, right. <laughs> um, but but it's how most people start playing with this kind of technology, um, and uh, and and we, we can do something like that and. Uh, so for, for the logic analyzer example, that would be a possible uh, application um, for, for this that you can't really implement with, with, with the vendor tools. Uh, also for, for like licensing issues, uh, but also for other issues because right, they- Right, because if I, you don't want to give me all the source code for an ARM probably, but you might want to be able to enable me to play, you know, give that custom logic next to the ARM. Right? Yeah, and uh, yeah. Is that is that one of the concerns I would suppose? Like, so if you can, if you could uh, reverse engineer a bitstream of something that has an ARM internally, could you then go and pull out the Verilog that determine what that ARM processor no, does? No, because that ARM processor is a hard IP block. Oh, okay. okay. So it's 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 not really configured by so the bitstream. They don't even give, they don't even give uh, the the bitstreams that would have yeah an because ARM processor there is no bit, bitstream. So um okay. um. With with other devices, I I think Altera once had a uh, soft IP arm. Yeah, they, I remember they had like early. They used they had like really early stuff. They had like an M not an M zero, but it was something before an M zero. Yeah. but yeah. the uh, the processor blocks in in Xilinx FPGAs. Um, so Microblaze. Uh, well, <laughs> Microblaze is of course a soft IP. Um, yeah. So yeah, you 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 could you could generate a Microblaze netlist by um by looking at the bitstream but you don't actually need to you can just generate a timing netlist for example and then the tools will already give you a netlist for the microplace um so the only thing they're really hiding there is like the the more readable actual Verilog code they put in right um, but for stuff like when you look at the older uh vertex 2 post they had power pcs in there they have they uh -huh. were hard ip blocks uh and now in 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 Tynx, the uh the arm is in hard ip block 
Um, yep. So only thing that the uh, the bitstream does is configuring how this hard IP block connects to your logic, uh, but it but the IP EP block itself is a complete black box. Um, and you could swap out the 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 theoretically the the ARM block with the Risk Five block, for example. I mean, as as vendor Xilinx could do that uh, without having to change the bitstream format. Right. Right. As long as the interfaces are still compatible, that is a, that's a great segue. So let's let's talk about Risk Five because that's that's uh, so you you had mentioned to me before the show that the the Risk Five is entering the chip scene. So obviously we've heard some of the stuff we've talked about. Me and Dave have talked about it a little bit, but like you told me that like it's actually pretty pretty high interest levels in uh, oh yeah in the chip community. Yeah. So um, so if you're like in the ASIC community, then then you definitely have heard of Risk Five. Uh, and probably your company has some kind of project that is using Risk Five or is related to Risk Five. Um, uh, and, and just as one data point, so at the last Risk Five workshop was was um, two months ago, something like that. Um, okay. Uh, uh, Western Digital uh, actually, so Western Digital is is shipping a, a billion processor cores a year. Oh my god. Um, just as, in their hard drives or in other stuff yeah, too. Yeah, in the hard drives okay. and uh, whatever else. But um, but if you if you look at the modern hard drive, it has a couple of small processors in it, uh, so that or adds up to about a billion processors a year. And they have now announced that uh, by uh, 2019, they would like to have them all replaced by Risk Five. Whoa! <laughs> wow. Okay. So why? I mean, is it just because it's free or because they want to uh, well, at, customize at least, it or? at least they they claim it's not because it's free um and i also i don't think that this is the 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 main reason for them to do i it. mean imagine the ip um, cost would be a, a, a small portion of the overall cost of making a thing so yeah yeah so, so the uh the the main thing i guess is that uh you have you have a wide range of cores to choose from from different vendors that have different application domains in mind. Um, and you can always use the same tools. You don't need to retrain engineers to the ARM tools in this case, and then some special instruction set in the other case. Um, you can easily switch vendors. Um, you can easily extend processors to implement additional features that you just happen to, to need for the application you, you work on. Uh, so maybe we should start out by explaining what Risk Five actually is. Sure, that'd be uh, great. Just because yeah. uh, Lord knows uh, me and Dave didn't do a good job with it. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, so Risk Five is uh, not an open source processor. It's an open instruction set architecture. Okay. So like x86, yep. which is an architecture that has two components for the most part implemented. There are a couple of others too. Um, but if if I would like to implement x86 for um, for my hobby project uh, and just release an x, uh, x86 capable core on GitHub, uh, then Intel would sue me into the ground uh, <laughs> <laughs> right away. Um, They're um, good at that too. Yeah, yeah. And, and the same if I would build, for example, an ARM processor. Uh -huh. um, and uh, so it's not like those big, vendors uh, have forgotten to open source their instructions and architectures. Uh, no, it's, it's like a huge asset for them that, that they have a monopoly right. um, on, uh, uh, on these instructions and architectures. At the same time, they are benefiting a lot from a huge open source community of like compiler developers and, and debugger developers and, and whatnot, uh, building software that targets their instructions and architectures. Um, and um, I always say, uh, in comparison, building a processor is actually very, very simple. The hard part usually is not building the processor. The hard part is building all the software tools around that processor. Huh. Um, and I could build my own ARM processor uh, to reuse that, that universe of tools that is available um, from, a, from a technical point of view. But, but legally, I can't do that. Right, um, and that's where Risk Five comes in. That Risk Five is, is an open architecture that everyone can implement. Um, what is the hard part of the software, though? Is it just the scale of the getting everyone and like buy-in from everyone? Is that kind of the hard part? Uh, well, yeah, a couple of things. It, it's the, the the scale of the project to start with, uh, but also 
for example, you build compilers. Uh, it's not only that you need people building compilers. You need also a lot of people using that compiler right. and looking at the compiler outputs very, very closely and saying, oh, I'm convinced in this case the compiler could actually do a better job. Uh -huh. and, and wanting that enough to create good test cases and then contribute those test cases to the compiler developers. So if I build a, a, a processor just for my own use and then I retarget uh, GCC, for example, for this processor, I still don't have this, this huge user base that will provide me with very valuable test cases that help me optimize my compiler. Mm. Uh, so you really need this, this whole ecosystem um, around stuff. Okay. Um, and, and with RISC-V, the idea is we only need to do that once. <laughs> and and then, then because everyone is using RISC-V, uh, we, can, we can benefit from this work that has been done once and we don't need to redo it whenever we build a new processor because we can't reuse any like large um, ISA. And RISC-V is supposed to be like this large ISA that everyone is allowed and supposed to actually use. So um, do you actually do you actually believe that or no? Like, do you think that if it only has to be done once or is this going to be like that XKCD comic where it's, we have 14 standards and it becomes 15 standards? Um, so um, I, I believe that to a certain degree um, because... Uh, it's not like there are 14 other open ISAs out there with the same goal. Um, okay. okay. There are a couple of open ISAs out there that predate Risk Five, but they were never meant to be this like universal standard, um, and they usually uh, evolve from from one specific processor implementation. Uh, so usually the life cycle of an ISA is that someone builds a very popular processor. And that processor happens to implement a certain ISA. Okay. And now this ISA becomes popular. And then a couple of years later, they build a new processor and they support the old ISA because people are using that ISA already and the compiler is there and so forth. Right. Um, and the ISA used to be really, really optimized in the way they encode stuff uh, to the original processor. But by the time you have the second processor in the family, um, it's not that optimized anymore, actually, uh, okay. because you, you can't change the ISA to fit right. the microarchitectural choices that you have made in the in your next right. processor Everything generation. Everything else is just bolted on, right? It's just yeah. a, right. And, and, and idea, I should also just clarify, you keep saying ISA, that, that is I, instruction set architecture, right? Yes, that's instruction okay. set architecture. Right. Okay. Um, and, uh, and with RISC-V, the idea is we just skip this initial part that we first optimize the ISA for the microarchitectural choices of one particular microprocessor. Um, and then uh, maybe it will be hard to write a processor that is as good as a match to the ISA, like this initial one. But the, the successor processors in those other ISAs are usually uh, a, a larger mismatch to the ISA than what everything is to RISC-V. Because RISC-V from the very beginning was meant to be a, a universal thing. It did not start as the ISA used in this particular processor and then it became popular and other people like emulated something that's compatible. Is this does this have the risk of being the Esperanto of the processor world though? Like Esperanto uh, is meant to, you know, be the <laughs> ultimate standard of language, but nobody uses it then, you know? Yeah. Uh um I, I don't think that nobody is using it because I mean Western Digital is committed to ship a billion uh, Risk Five processors two years from now, so I guess so. But maybe they'll just <laughs> speak in Esperanto, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, um, so I, 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 in my opinion, Risk Five will be very successful. I mean, it already is very successful. Okay. Um, the other question is, will we need a different Risk Five like project twenty years from now? Um, because Risk Five, in my opinion, is also a very good ISA. So it tried to to learn from all the mistakes that have been made in the last thirty years. Uh -huh. um, but maybe over the course of the next thirty years, we will realize that some other things would be better decisions. Um, and then in thirty years, there will be something new. Maybe a Risk Six. Maybe something <laughs> else. Um, well, hopefully, they they get a little bit more creative at that point. But yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but. Uh, there is one thing that I'm certain about, uh, okay. and that's whatever will come after RISC-V will still be an open ISA. 
Okay. So I think that's the important point. Uh, it's not that is Risk Five better than everything else or, or, or not. Um, it's uh, we are right now at the point where we move from proprietary ISAs, where one company owns the exclusive rights to decide who is allowed to implement it and uh -huh. who is not allowed to implement it, to open ISAs. Um, so and, you're, selling, you're saying I should sell all of my ARM stock? <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I, I I can't comment on that. Um, uh, That's okay. One, I, I didn't have any anyway. So. Okay. But but one, one data point is that ARM usually was uh, um, very secretive with their actual code. Uh -huh. So if you wanted to use something like an ARM M0 in your ASIC, you would need to go through long negotiations and... Yep. Probably only at the end of those negotiations, you would be allowed to to actually see the HDL code and play yep. with it and try to integrate it with your system. Yep. Um, and recently, ARM has put uh, the code for the M0 and the M3 on their web page. You can just... Wait, really? Yes, yes. <laughs> wow. you, you just click on I accept the conditions and then you can download uh, a, a zip file or whatever it is. Um, and of course, it has a license that says you're not allowed to actually use it in an ASIC, but you can start playing around with it, integrating it right away. Um, and um, um, some ARM people say, yeah, but we have actually been working on that for a long time now to make this a little bit more open and it has nothing to do with RISC-V. But I think it has everything to do with RISC-V. So it's like um, uh, writings on the wall, you better get, op get open or, or get out kind of thing? Yeah, I, I think um, um, if if you're an AC company and uh, you don't have an existing relationship with uh, with ARM or any other vendor of processor IP, so this is not specifically about ARM actually, um, you have to go through uh, uh, certain negotiations that take up uh, uh, months at least. Um, before you can actually start integrating the core. And usually your ASIC will have a little bit of your own magic sauce plus some kind of, of microcontroller uh, the, that runs everything. Right. Um, and if you have to, uh, to wait another six months before you can go to market, uh, then this is a huge issue. Right. You're um, dead in the water sometimes, right? I mean, like, yeah, that could be, yeah you missed your opportunity. And, and with uh, the open source ISAs, there are open source processor cores that you can just use right away. You just download them from, from GitHub and start experimenting. And maybe you don't end up using exactly that core. Maybe at the same time, you start negotiating with some commercial vendors of RISC-V right, processor cores. Right, right. Someone who's tested uh, it and does does a little bit more uh, yeah, verification. If, 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 if you feel more comfortable with that. But you're not that in the water. You right. can do all the other development, integration right. work. Uh, and you're using the software tools that you mentioned too, right? That's yes, the idea yes, is that your, yes. your workflow is so, out there. Um, so, and I think that's the, the, the reason for, for ARM, for example, to be suddenly so open with their M0 and M3 designs that right. they want to be in a situation where people can say, oh, I can just download the, uh, the course. I can start integrating them. I can start testing the system right away right. while the negotiations are going. Um, yeah. Right, and I'm sure that ARM has you know, very capable lab techs that can open up any chip, see what looks like an ARM, an ARM core, and then sick their lawyers on someone who didn't actually pay the licensing fee, right? Well, um, I, I don't know if they're actually doing that. Um, I, I don't either. I'm just guessing. You know, like, but like that, I, I just mean that like the licensing is a separate issue than the than the code. That's the idea. So uh, I think if I'm building a chip, um, I'm more concerned about uh, uh, having someone that I can yell at if something goes wrong <laughs> than yep. than not paying yep. the 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 sent uh, for for the ARM core right? Yep. Um, or whatever it is. I mean, it really depends on what kind of core you have and what kind of volume you have and uh, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, so that's RISC-V. Okay. Uh, and I learned about RISC-V um, maybe three years ago. Okay. Um, and I was uh, uh, immediately sold. I mean... Uh, this is I, I I've I've built my share share of processors and then custom compilers to targeted processors and all that kind of stuff. Uh -huh. um, so uh, yeah, 
uh, I immediately knew I, I, I want to do something with that. I don't know what yet, but I want to do something with that. Well, you've did, um, you did something. You just gave a talk about it. <laughs> what were you talking about? It at, at, uh, well, uh, yeah. I, 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 I built a processor. Okay. Uh, so it's called Pico RV32. Um, it's in an odd design corner a little bit uh, because it's, um, um, it's, it's a small processor. It's not really the smallest processor you could ever build, but it's a, it's a relatively small processor. So in Xilinx 7 series FPGA architectures, it's about 750 lookup tables large. Uh -huh. um, and uh, it's optimized for very, very high clock speeds, but not for performance. Um, so it has actually pretty poor performance. It takes a couple <laughs> of cycles for each instruction. Okay. Um, but because it runs in a very, very high speed clock domain, you can run it in the same clock domain like your, as your actual processing cores. Oh, um, so no translation of clock domains then? Yes, you don't need to ah. cross clock domains to go from your uh, work core right. to your control processor. And that simplifies the designs a lot. Right, and um, you don't have to wait on stuff either, right? You're just, you just pass it through and it's yeah. fine. Yeah, but I mean, clock, clock domain crossing is always a... a, a a very complicated thing where I can uh, get a lot of stuff wrong and you would like to avoid it at any cost if, if possible. <laughs> yeah. Um, then it, usually when, when you cross clock domains, you have to figure out how to convert something in like a, a stream of data. Um, so, so some things need to have like uh, additional abstractions and, and translation layers uh, so that you can actually get your data from one clock domain to right, the other. Right. Um, and and the idea was that I would la wanted to build a RISC-V processor that is well-suited to be a control processor that avoids all this kind of, of issues. Um, and if you have to cross clock domains, for example, and you have a, a more complex um, application uh, that you actually have like an address data bus uh, with arbitration and, and all kinds of things. Um, uh, it's not uncommon that actually this integration to this bus system with crossing clock domains and everything is larger than my processor would be. So uh, w the the crossing logic you're saying is, is yes, larger. Yes. Okay. So it's it's uh, so with this thing so small you just sprinkle it in anywhere. That's kind of the idea. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. That that okay. that's the whole idea. Okay. Um, and uh, yeah, uh, interestingly, a lot of people are using it uh, for for different applications. A couple of people have actually taped it out on ASICs um, oh, wow. okay. as well. Yeah. Um, one one very big uh, company that, that builds like TV sets and stuff like that uh, told me that they are using it in one of their ASICs. Cool. Um, um, so I don't know for what exactly, but. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, but, but apparently... Maybe you get a sticker on the outside at some point built with a Pico RV32? Yeah, probably not. <laughs> but, uh, uh, you don't get like the yeah. Intel inside? You can't, make your, you can't make a sticker like that? Come on. Yeah, I mean, I could make a sticker, but I, I think they are not going to make <laughs> yeah. it, put it on their devices. Right. Um, That's what's crazy I mean, too, is that like, yeah, the, with the licensing days, like you had to know it was there. Now it could just be in anything, right? Yeah. yeah. Wow. And I mean, that's a big problem with all kinds of open source projects. Right. But... Uh, that that usually have very very poor data on, on who is using your stuff and and what for. Right. Um, usually have a little bit better data if your documentation is very poor, uh, because then people will will ask you questions. <laughs> uh, and usually you can you have a very very good idea from the kind of questions people ask right. uh, about how deep they're in and and if they're actually using it or just thinking about using it right um well you got 71 people watching your your github repo so you could probably say there's at least 71 people interested and 368 started so yeah, yeah at least yeah. 368 <laughs> read it so there's like your but, that's like your floor right yeah yeah right <laughs> um but actually i'm i'm more interested in in like the the one really auto interesting users yeah. than like the, the the number of people sure. using it um and uh, so, so one one thing that I'm very proud of is that the uh, Berkeley Lawrence National Laboratory uh, uh -huh. that have a synchrotron, uh, yeah. they are using Pico RV32 in their interlocks. Oh wow! Uh, I've learned recently, which makes it the second particle accelerator to use uh, some kind of code that I've written. <laughs> um, 
Well, there you so, go. Do uh, that a so couple I, more times, and I think they name a particle after you eventually. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so. Um, <laughs> but uh, so, so LHC is the first one. Uh, they were using, really? Yeah, yeah. They are using a library I wrote, lib, libxsvf. We okay. didn't even talk about that project yet. Uh, uh, it's, a, it's a library for programming FPGAs. And okay. uh, apparently the FPGAs on the accelerator ring for the control logic for all those magnets um, is programmed with my software. That is crazy. Did you get a tour? Did you get to go there and like tour around and stuff or no? Uh, I, so so I've been there once uh -huh. uh, for, for a conference, uh, but uh, this was uh, a few years after uh, they used that. So I'm not even sure if the people who implemented initially are still there. Uh -huh. um, but they uh, they essentially told me that that this is going to be there for at least the next 20 years um, wow. <laughs> because it's part of a uh, of the reference implementation of a field bus that they actually standardized. Oh, cool. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. So uh, I, I love like like things. Like, I mean, obviously, I love the, the 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 LHC, right? Those are large large hadron collider. That's the the, the right thing, right? Yeah. Um, the uh, but like it's like. It's the academics and the scientists actually doing these really huge things, whereas usually, you know, that's usually smaller, lab-based, you know, resource constrained, funding constrained, and yet LHC is just like huge stuff. And so, and they're using open source, which is extra cool. Obviously, you know, with with uh, CERN using KiCad as well, I'm a big fan of that. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah they're also pushing open source a lot. Exactly. So. That's great. That's great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's it's funny because uh, so uh, that was when when they, when they uh, used it initially the first uh, like like revision of LHC uh -huh. um, uh, was back at the time where uh, some people had this theories the the large hadron collider will create a, a black, <laughs> black hole, hole. Right, yeah, right 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 uh, you're just... talking about the website has has the large hadron collider ruin the or ruin the <laughs> earthlight or something <laughs> like that. Uh, no, big... I don't know that. Oh, it's just a website that just says no, you know? Like... Ah, okay, yeah, yeah. <laughs> sure. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's uh, uh, yeah, let's, I'm, I'm not a physicist, but, uh, but, but, uh, uh, you know when they always say, yeah, that's not going to happen because the black hole will decay so quickly uh -huh. or evaporate so quickly? Uh -huh. um, actually, they should completely change the language and they should say the black hole will explode so quickly uh, <laughs> because... The, the 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 radiation given off by a black hole is getting uh, uh, larger and larger. Uh -huh. When the black hole uh, uh, gets gets smaller and smaller and has less and less mass, right. um, and then you have like a a yeah, it's it's yeah, it's, it's, better, it's better when it's a when it uh, when it goes the opposite direction, right? Yeah, and it's <laughs> it's uh, um, and and I think that this language of saying oh it, that cannot happen because it decays so slowly or uh -huh. it evaporates so slowly. Uh, that language has has like contributed to this misunderstanding that yeah, right. but what if it's not the uh, yeah, right. whatever. So back then uh, I was always making making fun that uh, oh if the the whole world is swallowed by a black hole it will be in part my fault or something like that. <laughs> uh, so it was like ha ha we can all die ha ha. Uh, but now that I know that they use uh, uh, the, uh, the my processor at the interlocks at this uh, um, at the synchrotron, I'm actually pretty worried. Uh, oh no! <laughs> so uh, because because uh, you're for, like the last for, line of defense, huh? For, yeah, man. man uh, for some crazy reason, it's like haha, we all could die. Uh -huh. uh, but but one person could die. It's not funny anymore. Right, it's exactly. Just, well, uh, if we're yeah, all yeah, gone. Yeah. Like who cares, right? Nobody <laughs> right. actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So <laughs> I'm sure um, it'll be fine. <laughs> yeah, but I asked them, uh, uh, why why are you using my my processor? Wouldn't you use something like uh, industrial strength uh, thing? Uh -oh. uh, uh, and and they said. Yeah, that's exactly why we don't use something because it's important. And then we talk to the commercial vendors. They just tell us, yeah, our processor is extremely well tested um, and 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 super quality and whatever. But they don't tell us how they came to that conclusion. That's right. Um, yep. These are scientists and, you're talking to, right? <laughs> and and it's it's like it's one salesperson who has no idea about any of the technical aspects. Right. He's just guessing what he should tell us in right. order to uh, 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 to get the sale. Yep. Um, but with Pico v 32 all the tests I've done are out there in the open. Yep. Um, and uh, I'm I wrote the, the framework that's used for formal verification of RISC-V processors, which is RISC-V formal. And I, I mean, 
Pico RB2 is, is probably the, the best formally verified processor out there in the RISC-V universe at the moment. Um, really? Uh, so they said they looked at all this verification because it's all there. And that was what, what convinced them that they actually would like to use my processor and, and not something from, from a big vendor because the big vendor would not would not show them how they can be sure that it's correct. Right, right. Op openness is a sales tool, you're saying, pretty much. Yeah. In, in, <laughs> without, in, without any sales. <laughs> uh, yeah, without any sales. But, yeah. but I mean, uh, 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 yeah, the, 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 the internet geek points I get for that are uh, right. uh, uh, much more valuable anyway. <laughs> right. Well, and it, it seems like, I mean, it is like an academic approach to it, right? I mean, like the showing your work, showing the... Show you know like uh, replicating papers that kind of idea right like, um... yeah yeah and I mean um, also um, I mean I might be a little bit worried that 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 my process is used for 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 critical stuff like that, uh, but actually I'm not I'm not really scared or anything because I know what kind of verification procedure I put in there yeah um, and. Uh, and I think that's also a difference when you when you when you have like the the commercial uh, vendors, uh, you can't invite the guy who actually uh, built the IP, right? And yep. tell them life is depending on your IP, and then look at the expression in his face, <laughs> right? <laughs> right, right, right. Um, but but you can do that with open source tools. So right. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is our design requirement well we want to scare the crap out of someone is that is that a possible design requirement <laughs> <laughs> right so i had a question about the um so you said the risk so you said risk five is an open instruction set architecture but it's not yes. open source now the pico rv is open source is an open source processor well the uh the risk five specification actually is uh some kind of open source okay uh but the thing is uh the that risk five there is Risk Five is no software, no hardware. Right, there's no Verilog the involved, right? It's yeah, just, so there, yeah. there is nothing that you would make open source. Okay. Uh, actually, there is uh, LaTeX code that generates the really? the, the document, <laughs> and that LaTeX code is under some kind of open source license. Yeah, that and, doesn't count. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, but there is no no other thing that like is Risk Five because Risk Five is is this English language document. Uh -huh. uh, that defines uh, how the ISA works, and uh, and soon will be also a formal specification, uh, because with 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 English documents there are always like uh, certain cases where you realize oh uh, it's not actually clear if it should be this or that way. Um, right. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah, but it, the idea is it's this specification. It's the it's the instructions and architecture. It's not the processor and the. Concrete implementations, some of them are open source and uh -huh. some of them are not. And it's very, very important that this is okay. So so nobody in the Risk V universe is like everything must be open source. Right. There's no, no Stallman's there is... Stallman's among the bunch. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, but at the same time, I think it's very important that there are some open source Risk V implementations. Yeah. Uh, because this enables so many uh, um, applications. Yeah. That uh, would not be possible otherwise. Yeah. Um, and and then there is still enough uh, space for uh, for commercial entities to say, oh, but we build a Risk Five processor that uh, performs particularly well uh, or is highly optimized for for seven nanometers uh, uh -huh. or, right, or whatever. Right. 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 Um, Right, and that's what, and yeah. then, and those, and those commercial applications like you're talking about, that's effectively the someone to yell at, right? So I'm paying that licensing fee. I need to talk to someone right now because at the seven nanometer node is not yeah. working as expected, yeah. and go fix this. <laughs> and so a lot of people are talking about Risk Five and saying things like, "Yeah, but does it perform uh, as well as as?" As x86, for example, uh -huh. um, and that's of course a pretty nonsensical question, right? Uh, because they implicitly compare different implementations. Right. Uh, they say is an Intel processor right. as quick as a Risk Five processor, and the answer is it depends on the Risk Five processor. Right. There are some Risk Five processors out there, and there are more that are under development right now, that are optimized for for high performance uh, single thread. Uh, uh, application um, uh, or, or few threads applications, so not GPU stuff. Um, 
the other implementations that are very high optimized for for exactly that for like more gpu like uh, applications um and and you have to look at the individual processors uh, and there is this this like implicit uh, assumption um that uh, instruction sets can be inherently better or worse for performance. And of course, when you look at extreme examples, then this is the case. Um, but really, if a, a well-designed instruction set architecture would be necessary for good performance, then Intel could not compete. Their instruction set architecture is, is 30 years old. Right, uh, yeah. And, and, and uh, came from from a a processor that was originally designed to be a, a, a control processor and peripherals. Huh. Um, so, is it the um, the early like the early Intel days? Is that the idea? Is like the well, the original eighty eighty was okay. like meant for for like being a control processor and printer units and stuff like that. Oh, okay, okay. Um, and then uh, uh, IBM came along and they realized they just. Were too late for the PC revolution, um, and so they started this project to build a PC within a year, um, and they wanted to use uh, the uh, um, um, sixty-five uh, thousand series, um, but couldn't because Motorola could not uh, um, guarantee them the, the numbers, and Motorola was not. Um, did not want to give licenses to other fabs to, uh, to produce right. replacements. And then they went to Intel because they had something that was easy enough to integrate and said, we want to use your processor, but Intel didn't have the capacitors at the time either. So Intel had to give a license to AMD to build x86 or 8080 processors at the time. Um, uh, so that IBM would have a guarantee that they could always buy uh, the chips in the numbers they need. Um, yeah, that that's how how the instruction set <laughs> became like the PC instruction set. It, it's so, so like the eighty the x eighty six architecture is like dependent on like nineteen eighty nine Christmas time. Is that kind of the idea? <laughs> yeah, yeah, and and then uh, and then uh, consumer uh, demand driving. Yeah, yeah. Consumer, I think it was yeah. a little bit earlier than that. Yeah, uh, uh, okay. but but yeah, some some yeah. some time in the eighties. Wow, um, that's crazy, and, right? <laughs> So uh, now we're finally fixing this in 2018. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> but but my, my point is not, oh, Intel is such a uh, such a horrible instruction set. I mean, it is using a horrible instruction set architecture. Uh, but the point is, despite the fact that they are using this horrible instruction architect set architectures, they can still build high performance processes. Right, right, right. Um, so I think the whole discussion about, oh, but can Risk v be as performant as x86 is a red herring uh, uh, because x86 is not fast because they have a great instruction set architecture. They are fast because they build good processors. Right, right. Um, and if they would build uh, a Risk v processors, uh, arguably they could build even better ones uh, because uh, um, a, a lot of the area in an x86 processor is actually dedicated to things like decoding instructions. Oh. Um, <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and that's one of the reasons why, why you have a, a more risk approach in, in embedded devices. So most stuff there is ARM. But even though the R in ARM is risk, uh, ARM wasn't risk for, yeah, quite it's, some time now. Right, 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 right. Okay. <laughs> But but it's still it, it's it's still a cleaner instruction set architecture than than x86. Um, yeah, so I think I think all those discussions are pretty much red herrings, and at risk five is uh, certainly a a good enough well designed uh, architecture that there is nothing in there that would prevent you from building high performance processors. Uh, but uh, uh, beyond that. The only thing that really uh, makes sense is compare implementations with implementations uh, when you're interested in, in in performance. Okay, so the last thing that I wanted to ask about was the. Uh, I mean, probably, I mean, sounds sounds like we could talk all day, and we've already been going for two hours. Oh God, <laughs> that's okay. Um, but you were talking about formal verification. So is that tied to all this stuff, or is that tied to to uh, you building it around the the risk five, or is it is that stuff we have already talked about? Yeah, so the formal verification is a very, very big topic for me. And and actually, 
Um, so I started the company uh, uh, a few months ago. Uh, that's why I'm not working in LIDAR anymore. Okay. Um, and and we are uh, um, providing uh, support and services um, mostly around our own formal verification tools. So all the open source tools uh, that we so, build so for the... formal. The, the marketer in me says you should probably say your company name now. Yes, it's, uh, Symbiotic EVA. Yeah, so it's yeah you all said it at the beginning. I know that. Symbiotic EVA, all <laughs> one word. Symbiotic EVA.com is uh, like more or less a placeholder for, for our web page. Cool. Uh, we are right now focusing on other stuff uh, <laughs> than, 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 than building the, the world's greatest uh, company web page. Right. Um, <laughs> That's when you so, hire the management people. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the thing with formal verification is, um, um, maybe I should should really quickly describe what formal verification actually sure. is. Sure. Yeah, that'd be great, actually. Uh, yeah. So when you have uh, a a digital design, um, so that's the kind of formal verification that I do. Uh, formal verification is used in many many fields and has many many meanings. Uh, but I'm doing hardware model checking. So I have a hardware design. And I have a list of, of safe, safety properties that essentially say uh, the design will never be in a state where, where this or this is the case. Okay. Um, um, so I don't know. The design will never be in a state where uh, you have reverse thrust enabled and not contact to the ground with your airplane. Uh, that would be, for example, a desirable <laughs> thing in okay. your control system. Um, and uh, then you do mathematical proofs that show that actually your design can never be in that state. Um, so when you do verification via simulation, which is what most people do, um, then you just try a limited set of inputs. And maybe your limited set may be hundreds or thousands or millions of inputs. Maybe you are, you are using fuzzing or other similar techniques, but still you're using a, a, a relatively small finite set of, of, of inputs. And by relatively small, I mean compared to the complete set of all right, possible right. inputs your design could see. I mean, if your design has a 32-bit input and you run it for 100 cycles, uh, then we have uh, two to the, uh, what is it, 3,200 uh, uh, different inputs that the uh, design could have seen. <laughs> and you could try them all out individually, but uh, the universe will die a heat right. death. Heat death. Gotta love heat death. Before you will come <laughs> nowhere near. Yeah. Well, the heat death is actually very cold, but uh, it's <laughs> <laughs> right. Heat death um, meaning that all everything's spread out enough, right? Where it's, yeah, yeah. yeah. Heat, heat death meaning everything on the same temperature. So, right. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. So, uh, so that's not an option. Um, but there are tools uh, that uh, can do something equivalent without actually going through the the work of having to try each and every possible input individually. Um, and when that tool says, yes, you're good, then this would be equivalent to running this, this simulation that you could not really run in, in right. reality. Right. Um, and this kind of stuff can be used for so many different things. Um, so I use uh, this a lot to actually verify my own synthesis tools. Uh -huh. So I can use formal methods to, uh, to show for a uh, particular transformation that the circuit after and before the transformation are still equivalent uh, because that's hopefully what the transformation does. It makes the design better without actually changing the design's behavior. Hmm. Um, and, um, and that's like collapsing logic, that kind of thing. Like, like would, would that be like a De Morgan's, like in a very, very, very simple case, like of translation um, of logic? Yeah. Um, um, it, it's, it's not... There are different ways how you can do that. Um, uh -huh. And there are more symbolic ways, but most of it is actually SAT solving, um, okay. which essentially, um, and, and again, oversimplifying a lot. Um, <laughs> this um, is the amp hour. Come on, man. <laughs> trying, trying all the di different combinations. And you uh -huh. say, okay, let's start with all the combinations where the first bit is zero. Uh -huh. um, and then maybe you can figure out that when the first bit is here, you can't even get to one of your uh, bad states anyways uh -huh. yeah. without having to try all the other combinations for all the other bits. Right. And then you're already done with the first bit. Yep. Um, um, and, and the tools do this using techniques like conflict learning um, that they um, try to, uh, to prune the search tree as early as possible. Huh. Um, and yes, as I said, 
this this is now very very simplified. Uh, um, but that's more or less what it is. Um, okay. There are different methods how you can do that in the in the in the nineties and also in the eighties. Binary decision diagrams were very popular. Uh -huh. um, but they have the disadvantage that for many real world designs you need to generate a a data structure that's exponentially large. Yeah. And you can't do that. Right. Um, and you run and, out of paper to print it on, right? Yeah, right, right. All that <laughs> stuff. Um and then there are sub based techniques, which are more the things that are popular now. Um and uh they 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 don't need to to generate exponentially large data structures. Um but they are not guaranteed to always find like simplifications. Um so they are potentially running for exponentially long, which is also bad. Uh, mm -hmm. So there's the saying that with BDDs, you run out of uh, memory and with SAT, you run out of time. Uh -huh. uh, um, but, but overall, SAT-based uh, techniques have proven to be the better choice. Okay. Um, and, and most of the tools the, that I wrote are using SAT-based techniques or things based on SAT-based techniques. Um, but the whole idea of building former verification tools uh, in part is to actually uh, hide all these details from the user. Um, and, and there is this, this meme that in order to do stuff like formal verification, you need to be like a math PhD. Um, and for some techniques, you have to be. <laughs> uh, but for others, you, you don't. Uh, and this, this kind of techniques, the automatic techniques, this is the things where, where my tools work, where you essentially just say, this is the thing that I would like to prove. And in most cases, the tool will reply in reasonable time and either say, yes, you're right. This is a property of your circuit. Or it will say, no, you're wrong. And here is a simulation trace that demonstrates that you are wrong. Right. Um, so then you could take that and then actually go and yes. dive into the details yes. of it. And, and that's why it's also very equivalent to like running all the possible traces. Yeah. Because it will show you like the one trace uh, that uh, uh, that actually violates your properties, um, but it will, using magic, uh, <laughs> uh, uh, find a way to to happen to try this trace much much earlier than almost all the other combinations of inputs. Huh, interesting. So, uh, so what, what what kind of clients then would be looking for this in general? I mean, like, is this like? These are ASIC vendors that are looking to verify some special design. Is that the yeah. idea? So okay. uh, um, historically, the, you use formal methods for things where you absolutely need them, where like uh, standards that require you to do that. Um, and you can use my tools for, for that as well, probably. Uh, mm -hmm. There might be issues with certification or whatever. Sure. Um, yeah. But um, what we are actually trying to do is making this kind of techniques uh, more popular. Um, because um, say, for example, you build a processing system um, and you, you usually go through a phase where you develop it and you find a lot of bugs there um, and then the developers are done and then they send it to the verification department and they do a whole range of different tests. Uh -huh. And one of the things is that they will implement your processor design in an FPGA and just run it for weeks. Okay. Um, and maybe you realize, oh, if we run this particular problem, uh, this particular program for two weeks, then suddenly the processor will freeze. Okay. And then they will send that to the back to the developers and say, if I run this program on this FPGA implementation for two weeks, then it will fail. <laughs> sometimes it might need three weeks. Sometimes it may crash after one week. But two weeks seems to be the average. Have fun debugging this. Yeah, right. That's that's yeah. basically saying there's probably a problem. Right? Yeah. That that gives no info, right? Um, uh, but if uh, if formal verification finds the same bug, it will find the shortest trace that demonstrates the bug. So don't you still need to know what the bug is, though, or no? Um, uh, well, it depends. Maybe, maybe okay. you already have properties that uh, that describe what the behavior of a processor should be, uh -huh. and um, and and then. And freezing usually is, is is one of those properties you would have. Usually, you would have some kind of bounded liveness, mm -hmm. where you say, uh, "If I guarantee my memory to reply within that many cycles, uh, then uh, my processor must retire a new instruction at least every so and so many cycles." Huh. Um, so, and and maybe maybe it's twenty cycles for your uh, for your thing, 
and, and maybe you put that into your formal tool and the formal tool will return with a trace of 50 cycles where the processor is doing nothing in the last 20 cycles. Huh. Okay. And then you know, okay, something is going wrong here. My right, processor yeah, just yeah. froze. <clears throat> okay. And it's it's a simulation trace. So you see all the internal signals. You so know exactly what, what, what is happening. Right. Uh, so this is something that you can actually uh, 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 troubleshoot very, very quickly right, because it's a right. very small trace. Moreover, this is something that you can run very, very early in your design process. So it's not like you're sending a design back to an engineer who worked on that one and a half years ago. Right, right. You, you're telling the engineer the change you did yesterday broke the design. Yeah. And please fix it now. And this completely changes the economics yeah. of of what what cost actually is produced by by having had this bug in in the design in the first place. Right. Um. And so it's almost um, like applying unit testing to processor design because you can run yeah. these faster test cycles and iterate faster. Yes. The only difference is that with unit tests you still only test one particular input, but here you test one particular property. Okay. And and the the properties can in part be very very complex. Okay. Um, and yeah, so this is the the kind of stuff that we would like to do with with our company to uh, get more people to use formal methods. Um, um, also FPGA people. Uh, right now, many people in the FPGA sector say, "Well, we don't need formal methods because a bug is not as expensive to us. <laughs> we can just update the bitstream." Yeah. But even if you have to update the bitstream, first you have to to troubleshoot the thing that might only happen at the customer uh, and, and not in your test lab. Uh, you have to figure out what the problem is. Uh, um, you might have customers who are now unhappy because they lost business. They had downtime of something sure, uh, yeah. because of your bug. Um, so if uh, so, so maybe for those kind of uh, of of uh, design uh, uh, companies. Um, it's not really an economic uh, uh, viable decision to make complete proofs for their designs. Sure. Um, but if there are some aspects of it that they can prove where it's easy to write properties, uh, they would give away a lot of, of, of potential of, of finding bugs early um, for no good reason, in my opinion, other yeah. than uh, that they don't have the expertise not, uh, yet how to use this kind of tools. Mm -hmm. um, because the tools that are uh, traditionally available uh, commercially in this sector, they target only at like uh, military satellites or uh, what right. not. Where people... Things that can't fail because you can't, you can't reboot them. <laughs> yes. yes. Uh, and, and even things that can fail, uh, uh, very often they're not formally verified. Only oh. when there is like a legal requirement to actually do formal verification. Interesting. Um, and then in those uh, settings, this is like seen as a, uh, uh, as a cost for the company. Right. Uh, many companies do formal verification then, but still believe, well, uh, uh, it would be cheaper for us to just take the risk of the thing failing right. than going through the additional uh, large project of doing the formal verification. Um, but because it's not so feasible for society, if that thing fails, there is a law that requires them to do the verification thing. Right. Um, but... Uh, yeah, but but we, we we don't even want to 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 be in that sector. We want to be in in the other sectors. Right, you're just saying that this is a cost savings. This is a useful yeah. tool. Let's make it more accessible. And in in a way, when it comes to formal verification, I'm a little bit uh, reminded of like the the home computer scene in the eighties. Uh -huh. um, and I mean, this is something that I know from 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 stories. I'm I'm not. Uh, I was too young in the eighties. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Me too. Um, <laughs> um, but. Uh, um, many, many people back then uh, were, were just programming stuff in assembler and they did not have access to compilers. They did know that compilers exist mm -hmm. and that people who work like with mainframes and stuff like that, that they use compilers for their work. Um, but nobody there really felt that they are missing out on something because they were not using compilers on their own. Right, uh, and in part this is because they never had a chance to actually work with compilers. Mm -hmm. They they just knew some 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 st stories uh, about uh, what compilers do and that they need these huge machines to run on and and all that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. um, 
Right, because and- until, until you have access to that higher level of abstraction, you don't know what's actually possible because you don't have the workflow yes. optimized and, yet. And also, if there is some kind of technology that might help you, but you cannot really access it right away. Right. Uh, I think it's healthier for you to believe that you don't need it anyways. <laughs> right? Well, it's, it's like denial in a nutshell, right? Yeah, and, yeah. and I think... Uh, uh, and I think that that's a big aspect here as well, that, that people say, oh, those tools uh, can can easily cost uh, hundreds of thousands or even millions yeah. of dollars. Right. Uh, so obviously we can't afford them. Uh, so let's just right. assume we don't need them anyways. It will at least make us feel better and it will not change anything that we can or cannot do. Right. Um, but now we have open source formal verification tools. So the the users universe, if you like, has a lot of, of formal tools, mm-hmm. and I use them in many of my projects. So what, and so are those those are in the Yosis tool, or are they external and have a different name? Um, well, so, some of them are really in the Yosis tool. Uh-huh. Uh, there is a separate uh, package called Symbiosis. Um, that uh, essentially that is a front end for users and other open source tools, uh, solvers uh, mostly, uh, that can work with users. Um, so users is taking your HDL, so it's be users is using users to convert your HDL design into a format that those uh, constraint solvers can understand. Then it's using those constraint solvers to actually solve the, the problem. But the output of that uh, thing will say um, assertion 25 or property 25 failed uh, when uh, uh, signal 28 is high in in cycle 12. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Um, But that's not good to you because you don't know what what, what signal 28 is and and assertion 15 or whatever whatever (laughs) I said. Um, So uh, the more complicated part is actually taking the constraint solver output and converting it back into something that the design engineer will understand and can work with, like a VCD trace and all that kind of stuff. Got it. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I just found a fi- or a presentation of yours that is shows a nice diagram. It's got like uh, Yosis SMT lib2 code, and then it's showing SMT BMC. Is that like an in between layer? Um, yeah. So so um, Yosis SMT BMC is a driver program that interfaces between uh, a format Yosis can generate and the format SMT solvers can uh, can understand. Hmm. And SMT solvers is one large class of constraint solvers. Um, so so this one thing can actually interface to to a bunch of different solvers. Okay. This is a lot of stuff. Uh, do you sleep? Do you, uh, are you? <laughs> um, yeah, actually, I, I I I think I sleep a lot. Okay, um, great. You, usually, good. I wake up with with uh, with a lot of ideas that I don't have time to implement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, wow. Yeah. Um, I, m- most of this is not actually as much work as you as you might think. Um, I mean, from, it's just tough to take in all at once. I think I think that's one of the main yeah. Things, I mean, you know? I mean. We've we've now gone through like fifteen years of of right. my work, right? Right. Uh, and we've, I mean, we've, we've we've skipped over a couple of things, but um, um, but I think what's uh what's a theme that that's kind of reoccurring uh, with with my project is that it's so important to uh to take your time to think about stuff. Yeah. Um, and and quite often, especially in a like commercial setting. Uh, you have external requirements that say, "Well, this must be done by next week." Right. Uh, right. So the project you need... manager set a, a arbitrary deadline. We must meet it, yeah. or else. Uh, so you have to start working on it and implementing it right now. Yep. Um, and it might take you the entire week, but maybe if you would have had time to think about it for a month. Not like full time sitting there eight hours a day mm-hmm. thinking about it. Yeah, you're talking about like, like shower thoughts, right? Like yeah, you're yeah, sitting in the shower like that. and like, oh yeah, yeah. crap, what if I did this, right? Yeah. And yeah. and and a month later you might implement the same thing and just within a day. Mm, I see. Because yep. because now you have detangled everything and you know how the individual components should should work together. Mm-hmm. Um and more when you build frameworks, maybe the thing that you build in one day will be much easier to work with in the future than the thing you would have built in two weeks. Right. Yep. Um, so so that's all snowballing in in a way. 
Right. Um, yeah, it's and, like and technical debt, right? That's the idea. Is yeah, like, yeah. You make some and, crap thing, you got to support it for the rest of your life. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, uh, so, um, um, and because of that, there are a lot of things going on. Uh, but but when you look actually at the like amount of hours going into actually sitting in front of a terminal window and typing the code, uh, that's that's really easy. The, the, the hard part is getting to the point where I say, oh, if I do it that way, then it's really easy. And then I just do the things where I've realized how, how it can be done easily. Mm, and you it. just have to have some 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 faith that uh, most of the problems uh, actually have a, uh, a, a relatively easy solution if you just take your time thinking about it. Um, not, not saying that this is necessarily true for, for everything. So there are sure... So within the user's universe, there are a couple of things where I just said, okay, I, I need to build this huge component. Um, and and for some reason, I'm, I'm convinced it actually has to be that big and no amount of, of meditating over it <laughs> will, will make it any better. Right, right. Then you just have, have, have to do it and lock yourself in a dark room for, for two weeks. And mm -hmm. um, um, yeah, but... Uh, um, but I think a lot of people sound much, much, uh, a lot of things I do sound much, much larger to a lot of people than they actually are uh, because they think about the problem and they have an, a solution in their head immediately, but not the solution that you come up with when you think about it for like uh, a month or two. Right, right. Um, and if they would think about it for a month or two, then they would also say, oh, actually, you just have to do it that way and, and uh, really easy and quick to do. Yeah. Um, yeah, so formal verification. I'm using that a lot in in all my projects. So um, the project iStorm stuff, for example, where I said I generated um, designs and then generated bitstreams and converted bitstreams back into Verilog. Um, mm -hmm. I was using formal verification there to prove that the generated extracted Verilog is still uh, formally equivalent to the thing I put in um, initially. Um, yeah. And so that probably saves a lot of time as well, right? Yeah. Like over, you have fewer, have fewer total test cases run, but they hit all of the important points. I have a very similar project called uh, Flockhammer that generates uh, a Verilog code, runs it through uh, various tools, and uh -huh. then uses formal verification to figure out if the thing is still equivalent to the input. And I found a lot of bugs in, in different tools with that. So open source tools and commercial tools alike. Mm. Uh, the main difference is the open source tools usually fix it within a couple of days. Uh, and uh, for, I mean, for Vivado, I have bugs open that I've filed like three years ago. Yeah. Um, right. And they, are really, they should be really, really easy to fix, but apparently nobody... We should just um, buy more buy more FPGAs and they'll they'll fix them. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I, I did actually talk to uh, to people by like um, huge amounts of FPGAs, and they pretty much say they have a very similar um, oh, um, experience. Yeah. Um, so so the so so you find some kind of bug, then you reduce it to a very very simple test case, mm -hmm. and then you send it to the vendor, and then the vendor will come back with a workaround. And say, well, just just write just do, this do line this like thing. that, yeah, and, right, right. and and then you're like, yeah, but uh, I spend a lot of time creating a simple test case to demonstrate the bug. Right. Um, it was really hard to preserve the 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 the, the incorrect behavior while shrinking it down to this right. thing, because <laughs> originally, of course, I had this huge thing in Simulink. And then I run it through this MATLAB module that allows me to generate Verilog code from Simulink. Uh -huh. Oh, uh, yeah, I've done that. And, and I spent like uh, uh, two months of my life finding this bug. And now you're telling me I should just make small <laughs> modifications to the generated Verilog code until it stops misbehaving. Right, until that, it stops that, giving that, that error, actually. Yeah, yeah. Not that, even that, necessarily misbehaving. <laughs> well, uh, 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 in, in, in most cases, those, those bugs are really like, uh, the tool says everything is right, but it has uh, incorrect behavior. Oh, um, okay. Which is horrible if you're doing DSP yeah. work. Because right. with DSP, it's usually um, any mistake, no matter how small, you just get garbage out. Yep. It's not like you can actually look at the output and say, oh, it's because it like swapped pairwise the weights on my <laughs> right. Right? Right. And it's Nobody looks at those numbers and comes to that conclusion. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so 
yeah, that's uh, that's a problem, uh, and I think it will become a a larger problem because more and more of the HDL code we actually implement is going to be generated by other tools. Yeah. Um, I've, I've done that flow before. That was one of my, the, it was like the worst time for me too. Cause it was like, it was a co-op. I was in college. I didn't really know what I was doing. I was just kind of like floundering around. And so I try all these things in MATLAB. I would generate the code. Didn't know what that looked like. That would get pushed into FPGA. Didn't know what that was doing. And at the end it was like an LED was supposed to light up. It was like, <laughs> <laughs> it's like a true black box that I, that it took six hours to iterate on. You know? Yeah, shit. Yeah. It was terrible. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So formal verification can be used in, in a lot of places. Um, I sometimes use formal methods just because I'm too lazy to write a test bench for something. <laughs> so I, I, I know I'm interested to see what the design actually does in this or that situation. Uh -huh. And if I write a test bench, I have to actually think about what my design does and what input do I need to put into my design to get it into the, the state I like to observe my design in. Uh -huh. With formal methods, I can use a formal cover statement uh, and say, just generate any trace that uh -huh. has this property. And the oh, formal wow. tool will figure out what, what to put into my design to get the design into this kind of state. Um, so... Uh, but you need to know how to use these tools, right? If yeah. if 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 you don't have the time to to use them, um, um, to just play around them, I guess we are back to this thing. You need to give people like a, a space mm -hmm. to uh, to learn new stuff, um, because uh, I think everyone should learn formal methods. But mm -hmm. if you uh, or at least everyone doing digital design. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm trying to think what the equivalent would be for like circuit design, like uh, like a. Anyways, that that's probably irrelevant here, but yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, well, I did talk to people about like using formal methods with uh, with spice and stuff like that. Uh -huh. um, but this is a whole different like area. Yeah. Um, uh, that's also very very in interesting that you use I don't know Monte Carlo simulations for example in spice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, and instead of doing Monte Carlo simulation, you actually want to be able to give certain uh, uh, parameters, ranges, and say, yeah. make a proof that no matter what concrete parameters I pick within that ranges, the uh -huh. circuit will always behave in this or that way. Right. You could um, say it so it's like you don't go outside this envelope of signals, right? That yes, kind of idea. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Um, but it's really, really hard to actually do that because if you look like at the uh, system of differential equations for a, a modern semiconductor process like BCMV 4.4, uh -huh. um, that's just, uh, I mean, it, it, it's 300 parameters or something like that and, <laughs> and, and many, many pages of equations. Um, so, um, um, so it's very, very hard to to make like trivial arguments uh, about interval arithmetic uh, with with that kind of stuff. And I, I don't know what the solution to that is because that's not the kind of formal method I'm 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 specializing in. Mm -hmm. um, but I think that's also very, very interesting. And maybe if the constraint solvers uh, improve, uh, maybe stuff like that will will replace stuff like Monte Carlo simulation and Spice. Um, that's, that's yeah. so far outside my pay grade. I can't <laughs> even imagine. <laughs> but um, with uh, so so about a year ago, I decided I wanted to build a um, a a reference system using my formal verification tools uh -huh. that would demonstrate that uh, you could do um, large non-trivial things with it, and it's not just this this toy program essentially. Uh -huh. Um, and traditionally, the thing that everyone said that's not possible to do with formal verification is to formally verify a processor against the ISA implementation of the yeah. ISA that the processor should implement. Okay. So I thought, just let's do that. Um, if, if I do the thing that the textbook says don't work, then I have proven my, my tool is, 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 is again Again, a challenge useful. is placed in front of you and you say, hmm, <laughs> yeah. I'd like to try that. Okay. Yeah, right, right. Um, but I, I would say at the time the textbooks have been written, this was actually true. Uh, okay, okay. Yeah, no, that's the, fair, right? But the constraint solvers, they improved a lot. Uh, and uh, as, as a field, we learned a lot of, of, of new tricks, um, how to encode certain problems. Um, and of course, uh, a lot of this uh, work was, was done at ARM because ARM has this ARM ISA formal project uh -huh. that does something very similar. 
Um, and luckily, they actually publish papers about it. So it's not like you have to piece things together from from uh, from information here and there. No, they just published a paper where they have described their process uh, um, very well. They they keep out some some things, but uh, for the most part, it's uh, it's very well documented what they do. Um, so I thought let's just make something similar for Risk Five. Uh, and let's build a framework. Again, I'm building tools. I always end up building tools. Uh -huh. I don't build a formally verified processor because that would be like the usual approach. Uh, instead, I build a tool that you can use to formally verify a processor. And so you could, so in, again, if you were going towards the heat death of the universe, you could throw any arbitrary set of bits against this. And then eventually you could say one of those arbitrary generated set of bits made a or uh, satisfies the risk v formal or sorry the risk v um isa um, or is that not really yeah, the point? yeah i mean theoretically you could use this for reactive synthesis okay. reactive synthesis is when you when you take the properties and try to infer a design from that okay. uh, but that's not what i'm doing no, um, yeah, yeah. and that would that would not be really possible with the reactive synthesis tools we have at the moment. Okay. Um, okay. So that's a very, very interesting field, but it's not that that far along yet. Um, so, but what we do is we take a processor we already have, and we try all possible programs you could say, so uh, all possible uh, machine code programs or uh -huh. bit patterns that you can find in memory, uh -huh. um, and see if there is one bit pattern that demonstrates that the processor can behave outside the ISA specification. So what if 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 you did find one in in like what does that represent in the real world? Is that like a segmentation fault or like what is that ultimately what would that actual real world error be that you're testing? Uh it depends. So okay. um um so I would say there are two classes of of problems that I can find with this approach um that are very distinct and different for us human talking about processors, but uh, indistinguishable for the tools. Um, one is I have a processor that always does the wrong thing when it comes to a certain instruction. Okay. Um, and just some engineer implementing the processor misread a line in the ISA specification <laughs> okay. uh, and implemented it incorrectly. And Got he would it. say, well, that should be very, very easy to find with testing, right? When the processor always does the, same, the wrong thing. Right, but, unless but it's really, really buried and it never gets called, right? Yeah, so there's this one instruction. It's a uh, jump and link register, J-A-L-R. Okay. Um, it takes a source register as argument, adds an immediate value to it, then clears the least significant bit of the result and jumps to that uh, uh, address. Um, and a uh, surprising number of processors does not clear the least significant bit of the result. <laughs> you, you have to read the spec very, very carefully to, to, to find that, actually. Um, and when you have code that is generated by GCC, then this code will never actually produce an addition result where the least significant bit is not already cleared. So you can have a processor that implements one of the most basic instructions incorrectly, and you can still boot the Linux kernel and the graphical environment and run a web browser in it um, <laughs> and, until you uh, find some strange uh, uh, chit compiler who uses the least significant bit in a function pointer to encode something about that function <laughs> and depends on this instruction actually clearing the least significant bit. Um, and so usually, the real question, though, is who is at fault here? <laughs> <laughs> Well, uh, in, in the meanwhile, now now when you run risk five tests, they actually test this. Okay. Um, but, uh, wow, but they that's didn't crazy. test it all the time. Yeah. Uh, so, so this is one of the reasons why someone is just reading the spec incorrectly. Mm -hmm. um, and then there is this other category of bugs where, um, um, where a function does something different from what it usually does in one very specific situation. Um, so usual errors there would be things like like in uh, in the pipelining of your processor and bypassing um, that you launch an instruction too early when the result it depends on has not been written to the register file yet, things like that. Okay. Um, or bugs like the following. Uh, that's one I like. You uh, uh, run a, you start a division instruction um, and 
uh, while the division instruction is running, you reset the processor. Um, and then you start, of course, executing your program code from like address zero or wherever you start. And one of the first instructions that you execute is another division instruction. But you must make sure that everything happens just at the right cycle or wrong cycle, depending on how you look at it. Uh -huh. And this second division instruction will, will, will return immediately with the result of the division you started before you reset the processor. So it didn't clear out some of the remainders and stuff like that? or It, it, it didn't properly reset the division engine. Okay. Um, and when it tried to queue the new division and it happens just in the right cycle, um, then it will think that the division result that is produced from the uh, the last division that ran until now is actually the division result of the division it just tried to do uh, right now. That's wow. a bug that I happen to have in Pico RV32. It's one of the last bugs I fixed and that you can only find with formal methods. Because, I mean, <laughs> wow. how, how, how would you like like test this with right exactly um, you wouldn't tell you tell your test group to be like well divide things and then shut down and then divide again yeah yeah but but try all different timing combinations that you right. could possibly have right uh, because yeah. only when you do everything just in the right cycle it, it will work otherwise it won't um and some people will say yeah but at the same time it's not really a big deal right because this will never happen in in production right um Unless and, your your processor's around for thirty years and running something at the Large Hadron Collider, right? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean, uh, um, or it's it's on a weird space probe yeah. that originally only had like a mission time of ten years, but it's still sending stuff. Yeah. Uh, and and thirty or forty years later, you can still uh, talk with it, and suddenly it freezes because yep. something like that happens. Right. Uh, that that would be really bad. It almost uh, comes <laughs> down to like a million monkeys, million typewriters type thing, right? It's like, yeah, just over time, you know, like at a human scale, we don't really care. Yeah. Right? We're mean, like, oh, well, what's the likelihood? But yeah, eventually, <laughs> something's going to happen. You know, you win the lottery eventually. <laughs> yeah. So, so, it's, uh, so, yeah, I mean, it all comes down to this. In the end, you try all possible traces. Yeah. Um, and, and if you really try all possible traces, you find all the bugs if your specification is, is correct and, and covers everything that your processor must do. And, and all the bugs apparently contains a lot of bugs that we wouldn't have thought about mm -hmm. um, um, before we had formal methods uh, mm. because we've never seen bugs like that actually being discovered. Uh, right. Uh, because <laughs> right, but yeah. but they still could right. There could be something yeah. buried in the x86 that is still waiting to. to I mean, you know. yeah, we we all the time discover new yeah. stuff. I mean, just just now we had this new uh, Intel bug. Um, oh yeah, the, 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 the where heating up and to, stuff. Yeah, you need to uh, uh, flush the TLB now whenever you switch from userland to kernel. So there is a fix for it, but it's a fix that's very decremental to performance. Um, um, yeah. <laughs> Yep. So, uh, so we wouldn't have things like that if if everything would be formally verified. And um, it's not always easy to formally verify anything. But if you have something that happens to be easy, you really should formally verify at least that aspect that you can formally verify. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I I did this risk five formal thing uh, mainly to to like show that the tools I wrote actually like mature tools and you can do non-trivial stuff with them. And now I've been to the to the Risk Five workshop and I had a poster presentation about Risk Five Formal. Um, and uh, um, it turns out a lot of people have Risk Five Five processors. Huh. And a lot of people are kind of aware that formally verifying things would actually be a good idea. Yeah. Um, so do you think that the that this formal verification, if it becomes standardized, would also help promote the Risk Five in the ecosystem because it just makes for a better processor. So now you have a ISA that's in a better shape. It's it's stuff's verified against it, so that makes it better. It's free. Yeah, it's open source. Blah, but, blah, blah. Uh, <laughs> but I mean, the the big competitor right now would be ARM, I guess. Mm -hmm. And ARM is pretty much doing the same thing. Oh, okay. Um, so um, the I think the main difference is the the thing we do with Risk Five Formal is a little bit more in the open. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So at least for some processors, uh, you you see the bindings between Risk Five Formal and the processor, and you can try to reproduce the results on your own. Um, and you could not do that at least last time I checked with with the ARM stuff. 
Uh, you still have a lot of, oh, you have to trust the vendor that they actually right. did all the <laughs> things that they did. Uh, I mean, I, I know some of the people at ARM who are involved with that, and I... Uh, I, I know that they actually do the stuff, <laughs> um, but still, it's it's always nicer to actually see the thing, right? Um, mm -hmm. And not having to trust the salesperson. Yep, that's great. Well, I think after two and a half hours, we should probably cut this off. But yeah, I, I think the likelihood <laughs> that I won't ask you to come back on and explain more of this stuff to me because I'm my brain's pretty full right now, and I'm sure that some of our listeners. Yeah, great. Uh, so, so I'd be be happy happy to come uh, come back uh, whenever. Okay, uh, great. So are you, uh, are fun. you, I mean, you were at uh, CCC this year, of course, and uh, uh, wh where else are you going to be in the near future that people might find you? Uh, I, I I don't know yet, actually. Okay. For, so I'm, I'm not going to be at Fostheim, I can tell you that, uh, okay. uh, because that's one of the usual suspects in a way. Yeah. Um, I, I will definitely be at the next Orconf, but that will be in fall. So that's quite some time until then yeah I'll, i will probably be in in the bay area a few times uh the the next year i don't know when exactly but if anyone there would like to meet up or uh, give a presentation on any of my work or stuff like that i'm i'm always happy uh to do that uh and if you're in the bay area just contact me and 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 I will contact you when, whenever I will be there the next time. I think I will also be in the DC area one time or another the, the next uh, year. Great. Um, um, so yeah. how do people how do people get a hold of you? What's the best uh, way? So probably Twitter is the best uh, best way. So I'm mm -hmm. at uh, OA1CXW. OA1CX. Yeah, I got that one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, and uh, yeah. Um, and that's your um, so you're a ham operator too. So maybe they'll catch you on the airwaves, right? <laughs> uh, yeah, I, th I think the my my Twitter handle is the only thing I used my my ham handle um, oh, in gotcha. the last uh, couple of years. So at least it's good for anything, right? Yeah, I mean, right, right. If you, if you have something that that's really assigned to you in a guaranteed to be unique way, that's uh, true. And it's only a short number of characters. Uh, that sounds like a good Twitter handle, right? <laughs> yeah, it's not bad. Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. Right. Well, uh, Clifford, thanks so much, man. This has been this has been a wild ride through processors and FPGAs and formal verification and everything. So I appreciate yeah. it. Yeah. Uh, so so maybe maybe we'll we'll do another one where we stay a little bit more on focus and mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, I think we wanted to talk a lot about the the Xilinx Seven series stop yeah. commenting yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah. So that might give us a a good topic for next time. I guess. I think that's that's a great idea. Awesome. All right. Well, that, we'll talk to you soon then. Right, looking forward to it. <laughs>